All righty, bow hunters, welcome back to another episode. Sitting here for the second time round, Mr. Liam Woods. Welcome back, Liam. Thanks for having me, mate. No, that's uh, cool. I, I feel like, again. yeah, Def. I feel like we've uh, we've really bonded after the last podcast. We got talking quite a lot and we message each other pretty regularly. Um, I think every year someone has a really outstanding rut last year it was brett meldrum this year i honestly think like the the ticket goes to you with some of the outstanding <laughs> animals that you got down it's pretty incredible and i think a lot of people as, as well as myself are pretty excited to hear about the, the little rut recap in general so i thought we'd maybe start there but we've actually talked quite a lot in detail about different podcasts that would be awesome to kind of drop um and as a second part to this podcast whether we launch it as a second episode or as a as of one episode, we're not sure yet, depending on how long we talk for. Um, but we're going to do a bit of a shot placement style podcast where really it'd be awesome if you guys jump to the YouTube channel when we get to that point, um, because it'll be very educational. I think we'll use, I'll, I'll use a lot of it as snippet videos and stuff. But at the same time, um, I think it's just going to be great for shot placement in general. I think some people do get a little bit lost with that. So I'm excited for that part as well. Um, but dude, tell us, tell us about the rut. How did, how did it kind of play out? Tell us about your work schedule and how you had to kind of work around the rut as well. Yeah. So I kind of went into this rut, like I had a pretty good rut last year and I was pretty happy with that. So Mm -hmm. I kind of just went into this rut, not really having any expectations, not really having an overwhelming desire to get a really big buck or really big stag or anything like that. Um, I kind of just wanted to help our friend Hoda, um, Jacob, who works at Bow Hunting Only, because last year was his first rut and he got his first valley buck and he'd ne- never hunted reds before, mm-hmm. never even heard like a red stag roar yeah. um, in person before. So he had three days that he could come hunting with us. So, yeah, we just dedicated those first three days to um, trying to get him a go and a bit of a taste of what it is like to hunt reds. Um, and were they going for him? Like were they roaring and whatever else while you are there? A little bit, yes, yeah. but the the rut in, at least in the area this year, was a bit different to most other years. Like most other years, you can kind of narrow it down to a two-week period where the reds will be going pretty pretty consistently. But this year, it was kind of more spread out over a longer time period. And some would go here, some would go there. And they were kind of like going in the two hours before sun up and then they go quiet and then you might, might be lucky and get a few rollers in daylight but mm-hmm. the first bit it was yeah it was kind of hit and miss um i've actually so heard the thought, same same report like across yeah most people i talked to about reds there was like a few people like started like you said you don't want to say it started late but it started late um like almost well. right yeah. at the very end of march was when everyone was like okay they've finally woken up like they're just starting to talk now but that was like I'm talking like 20, 26, 27, 28. Like that was when I got first reports, especially in the Brisbane Valley of like, okay, now they're actually really on. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, because we had, in that last week of March, we had in our sort of general area, we had two stags that were going consistently. And I put that down to they were holding a good number of hinds and they may have had a hind that was already cycling. Mm-hmm. Whereas most of the other stags that we were getting eyes on, they were kind of still just wandering around by themselves and we were seeing like lots of hinds and their yearlings and stuff still getting around by themselves. Yeah. So they hadn't been like rounded up or anything yet. Um, and I would say for us, it was April 3rd or 4th where they were really firing through mm-hmm. till, well, pretty much through till the 15th, which was the day that I ended up shooting my stag. We, he was roaring and we got him to a separate roaring stag that morning so they're still going off pretty well then so yeah it was definitely a bit later this year um so yeah the start my rut i pretty much had the 31st through till the 6th of april i'd taken two night shifts off um in that seven day period to give me that week and hoda had the first three days that weekend the first Mm -hmm. three days of that um that he had off to come with us so yeah just dedicated that to him got him out he heard his first um, roars like within a somewhat close proximity that first morning. And yeah, he was frosting it. He was like, this is the coolest thing ever. So we, just, we just tried to like make a play on that stag and sort of stalked up, got to within sort of 80 to 100 meters from where we could hear him. Um, but the wind was atrocious for this entire rut for us pretty well. It was constantly yeah. swirling mm-hmm. or just blowing an absolute gale. 
I feel um, your pain. Couldn't hear anything. <laughs> so, yeah, we kind of like made a stalk up, got ourselves into a bit of position, like on the same height as him on a bench, and he was sort of just around from us um, and started giving some hind calls and stuff. And we knew that this stag, my old man, was up there the previous week, um, and we we're pretty certain that this stag was holding a few hinds. So we mm -hmm. thought we'd be doing well to pull him away from him, but we gave it a go anyway. Um, and he did come closer. He came just to that where we couldn't quite see him, but we could yeah. hear him like he was right there. Um, and then, yeah, the wind just slowly started to drift back towards him and uh... just went dead quiet after that. So, yeah, that that kind of sucked him. And, um, yeah, we nearly got him a shot at um, a young fallow buck, chalky buck that was just cruising around, but he ended up coming in on the outside from scrub downwind. Mm. So, yeah, the reds weren't really going off enough at that point. Um, but that, I think it was that first morning after that um, encounter with that red, we sort of just went right up onto the tops and I got, got it right up there and, this all like tall phalaris grass. It's kind of like patchy in areas. Mm -hmm. so it was like a bit of um, a bench and I was like, I'll just poke my nose over the other side because you can kind of see down a little bit um, along the ridge. And I sort of went over there and there was this, I see this black pig in his long grass and I was like, had my bow sort of over my shoulders on my backpack, just not really thinking anything. I thought, oh yeah, I'll just see what it is. And then he sort of turns and like the sun was coming up sort of over the mountains at that point. So Someone's directly at my back, but he had me skylined. Like he kind of mm -hmm. just put his head up, turned, looked at me, and I could just see white like hanging oh, out. No. <laughs> I was like, I got like caught in this position, like hands on my bow, ready to lift it over my shoulders. And he was like one of those boars that even though he didn't know what it was, he knew something wasn't right. And he's yeah. one of those ones, like, as soon as he knows that something isn't right, he's just getting out of there no matter what. Definitely. And kind of like, he turned and trotted off directly away, just out of sight. And I've seen it in the past. They Sometimes they'll do this and they'll get out of sight and then they'll settle back down. Mm -hmm. So I, like, quickly just got my bow off my shoulders and got an arrow and I was like, oh, I'll just quickly rush over. Like, I looked back because I was like, would have loved to have got Hoder on you. I looked back and Hoder and my old man, I was like, I cannot see him. And I was like, I cannot miss this opportunity. I know where this ball's going. So I just quickly rushed over there. And then he was like walking. He was like kind of like doing a loop down over the rise and then around the side. And I was like, oh, that's typical. So I was like trying to cut a diagonal across. And I had him at 20. I was drawing back and he just wouldn't stop. And I was like chomping at him. I was like, and I was like, and he kind of just, Heard a bit of something and then on the walk just picked up a bit of a trot and like when ducked around this log out of sight again. I was, I was like, nah, he's gone this time. Yeah. But then again, I still had him back in my mind. I was like, oh, maybe there's a chance. So I quickly like <laughs> rushed over again and I was like, I'm going to try and keep on him until I see him like piss bolt out of there and I've got no chance. Yeah. So come over the rise and he kind of, he was walking around these roots. I speak to these wallabies across the front of him and they kind of like caused him to like stop. Mm. and he like just watched them and then some he must have smelled something on the ground because it was like real rocky and then all of a sudden he just put his he turned and put his head down started digging on this rock so i quickly <laughs> like got a bit of a range on him and then every sort of time i take a few steps i'll be like yep that's one meter closer one meter closer definitely while yep. i was drawn back and then he kind of like so you'd already so drawn back and you're walking towards yeah, him yeah, yeah i'm yeah. drawn back like walking down it's pretty steep and rocky so i'm like drawn back but kind of like looking where to foot pull my feet not yeah. make too much noise and like i stepped on a rock and as i took my foot off it it kind of like just shifted yeah. and just made a bit of a noise and he heard that he put his head up and like you know the boars the real like good boars they'll be directly us on but they'll turn their head just enough so they can like kind just of see, see you but you have no shot so he, he did that and i was just slowly because once again i still had the sun on my back so i was just slowly trying to get an angle on him and as soon as I cleared that hip, I just put it real low because I was shooting down. Mm -hmm. He was like on a downhill angle. So I put it sort of low, um, yeah, in the back of his ribs. And he dropped at the shot. I think it was about 26 meters. Yeah. So he's, um, he was reasonably aware still when you took your shot. Yeah. He was still aware. Yeah. And when I shot. And so, yeah, went in low, but he like dropped and rolled as he went to run. And it came out like up near his ear. And the broad had actually put a hole in his ear. And oh, when he turned, yeah. I saw that. It came out like really high and I was like, oh, bugger, like I've probably missed the offside lung kind of thing. 
And he just barreled downhill maybe 40 and then lost his feet and just tumbled another, yeah, 30, 40 metres. And no yeah. Way. Oh, I'd obviously like clean up enough of the major vitals. Yeah, that's this guy, right? Yeah, yeah, that's yeah. incredible. Yeah, big, he's yeah, got he's... some long to like. They're not real hooky. They're just fucking big and chunky, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah, they certainly stood out. And yeah, I didn't come across the ball like that good on our place yeah, incredible. in in a while. So yeah, just come across him. That was a pretty cool start to the rut. I mean, while um, we're here, although we're talking about deer, yeah. <laughs> um, <laughs> good to the big boys because. They're really, it's it's one of those things for me. I didn't appreciate mountain boars until I went and hunted them at uh, Randy's block last year. And now it's like, it's got me. Like I was literally, I was in the rut climbing up, trying to find Frank the tank. And then there was a rutten boar down below me. Started going off, like doing the squeals and stuff. I'm like, oh, yeah. I'm like, and I, there's, I, there was a moment. I'm like, do I? Do I go for him rather than going for Frank? I'm like, I don't know. <laughs> and it, actually, I was really torn. <laughs> um, but in regards to something like that, like, do you have a way, like you guys have cameras out a fair bit. Do you have a way of tracking kind of how many big boars you have on the block or is it, they're just too elusive? It's too hard. It's hard. Some, you will catch some, some you can, if they will come to a dam and they'll be there regularly over the, the couple month period, you know, they're hanging in that area, mm-hmm. but there's lots of times where we see animals only a hundred meters from that dam where I've got a camera. And that animal has not been on that camera once, but they're living there the entire time. So it's kind yeah, of, okay. you get hard. some, but you don't get them all. Yeah, so it's kind of hard. Like there's a ton of animals there that we would have mm-hmm. never seen. Mm-hmm. Um, it is good just to have the cameras out there, just see what is about and what you do catch. Like it's, yeah, yeah just use I'm always excited to go check it because you never really know what you're going to get. Because like we even, there was, we were at this, we walked past this dam and I checked the cameras literally 20 minutes before on this particular evening. And the next morning I was going on our hunt. We went back past and I was like, oh, I'm just curious to see what come in last night or this morning before us. Mm-hmm. Quickly checked them and a massive alpine dingo was on the camera from that evening, 15 minutes after we'd walked away from that area. And no I was way. Like, okay. That's crazy, hey. Yeah. So, so you expect it to be a little bit like that. Like... Get, yeah, we rarely get dingoes um, or wild dogs in our area, but mm-hmm. over the years you do get a pack or one or two sort of passing through. Um, so, yeah, that was – obviously we don't want them in, in our area and stuff. No, so definitely. Yeah. Livestock and animals and that kind of thing, but it was pretty cool just to see that. And, yeah, we would have Oops. never have even known um, yeah, if I didn't have cameras out. Yeah, it's actually a ridge at my block that I've not really explored much. It's a pretty new ridge that we've just kind of got access to. And so I haven't actually really hung out on it much apart from this rut. That was like, that was when I kind of followed Frank up a bit. And um, to be honest now, I'm like, okay, I want to get some cameras along this ridge because I'm not going to get the chance to actually really stalk it. But if I get some cameras up there and head out every once in a while and check it out, it'd be worthwhile. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. Yeah. So sorry, back back on to, uh, so how long did it take you to go and find Hoda and your dad then? Oh, they they heard the shot. They heard like yeah, cool. they they were coming up. They were just fell behind a little bit, and I was ahead of them. And kind of <laughs> we weren't planning to go the way that I kind of I just thought oh, I'd just split off, poke my nose over there, have a look, yeah. And then I would meet back up with them and yeah, yeah run into this boar. So they'd heard. I think they said they saw me. They saw me like frantically like ranging and like stalking like <laughs> over the skyline. So they knew I was onto something. <laughs> um, and then they heard the shot um hit him and then heard him battle down the hill so they they were like kind of there and come over and they're like calling out they're like oh like did you get him and i was like yes my arrow up there somewhere kind of thing and they came down <laughs> and, and got some photos and stuff um and yeah after that like the deer kind of went quiet we kind of yeah didn't really do much throughout the peak of the day just sort of hung out and stuff before the afternoon hunt and then because the reds weren't really going hard, I kind of split off. Um, my old man and Hoda hunted together mm-hmm. and they went in a different direction. I was like, I'll go to this different part of the place and try and like locate the red oh, or yeah, like, or yeah. something um, that we could target the next day. Um, and yeah, it didn't really come across a whole lot. Like a couple of fellow bucks sparked up but that in that last like 10 minutes of light kind of thing, mm-hmm. just enough to sort of know the general area that they were in. Um, but didn't hear any reds over that side. So the next morning, her and my old man went back the same direction that we heard that red um, the first morning. Yeah. And I sort of 
it off back over to where, where I went because I had a couple of cameras over there. I didn't quite get some the day before. I was like, yeah, I want to go check these cameras. One of them's in a really good spot, and I reckon like there'll be something on the camera. Definitely. So, yeah, I went over over that way, and just after the sun came up, a fallow buck sort of sparked up. So I headed towards him and then run into some pigs, and <laughs> there were two pretty good boars. The black one that, that I ended up shooting, but up above him in the middle of – 80 roos, which is typical for a wise old boar, mm-hmm. surrounded by roos and other animals so they can like alert him to danger so he can get a Definitely. feed right And yeah, he was like a real light, brindly gray, like with a couple faint spots on him. He was yeah, wow. real cool looking boar. And he was like, he was the better boar. Um, but I had all these other like the sows and this other black boar in the way. And I was like, oh, I won't be able to get around <laughs> in the wind direction. Um, so I like cut around, stalked in on this black boar and I was watching him. I was like, yeah, he's got, he's got a good bit of hook on him. And then the moment I decided, I was like, yeah, I can't pass this up. So, and at this point, like that fellow buck started up again and he's only like a hundred meters away and I still can't see him. So I'm like, oh, bugger it. I'll like, I was love yeah. shooting boars. So yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, yeah, um, drew back. And then at that moment, the wind actually sucked back and he put his head up and like started to sniff and I just like. Yeah, sent the shot at, I think it was about 17 metres through the heart and he sort of ran down, did a bit of a loop and he was dead in like six seconds, like just yeah, wow. feet out from under him type of thing. So the other seals, they didn't really, they kind of ran off but only made it 50 metres and started feeding again down in the gully. So they went away mm-hmm. from um, that brindle fellow. I quickly cut up there, but there were so many roots. Like he was there and I got to... 40 was the closest I got from him. And he kind of just started to like, there was that time of morning that he just started to like move off. Yeah. And he was cutting up like through all these roos. And some of the roos were bedded, some of them weren't. I was kind of like pushing forward. So the roos would like, they'd see me, but I didn't want them all to go in a wave. Definitely. So I was kind of pushing a couple. Then I'd walk a few, like forward a couple of meters, push a few more. So that's usually but that's that usually how you deal with kangaroos. You're always just kind of like trying yeah, to maneuver a little bit yeah. by bit. Yeah, yeah. I don't want them to move past and hop past just in their normal manner. Whereas yes. if ten or fifteen of them off. go flying past in one go, mm-hmm. everything that they go past, they're like, "Yep, nah, we're out of here." Definitely. So those roos kind of slowed me down. Like that ball wasn't slowing down. He was just moving off up over the ridge, and when he got out of sight, I was like. Uh, bugger it out. so I just sort of ran up Roos went everywhere poked my nose over I just caught his tail going down through this thickest steepest like section of, of this place so I was like oh, hopefully he's around on another day um, <laughs> so yeah went, went back to the black ball that I shot um, and set him up got, got some got some cool photos and took his bottom jaw and then made my way back to camp and mm-hmm. heard him old man like hadn't had any luck um, the next morning was Hoda's sort of last morning, which didn't really get onto anything, which was, was that, a bit disappointing. Was that the um, other black ball? No. Oh, I haven't actually posted it. Yeah, I mean, so that's a, yeah, okay, yeah. gotcha. Um, yeah, I'll post it up here in a day or two. A few people have seen it. Um, I put a lengthy, very lengthy um, sort of hunt recap of all my videos and the shots and stuff on my Instagram uh, story. Yeah, definitely. It's cool to watch. Um, so, yeah. And then we had to drop Hoda off so he could come home. Um, and, yeah, the rest of that following three and a half days that I had, we were getting on to Reds. There was one in particular that was kind of like the best one that we kind of wanted to target. He was a big 4-4, four, 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 so he was missing his seconds. So mm-hmm. had his brows, his trays, and then like a fork, like yeah. a five normally would at the top. But it was like real wide. He had like a real nice sweep. Yeah on him and a bit of, a bit of length like for a four for a four four like that missing seconds like he had a lot of beam so it looked pretty impressive was he on his way up or on his way down you reckon like he's over the over the seven years sort of thing young ish but so he'll be big, yeah he'll be bigger next year like it was one of those yeah. things where if we got a good opportunity to make a really good shot on him we we're gonna take it yeah um because he's obviously genetically missing his seconds which we have a lot in our area now we reckon it stems from um that Real big stag, Jack Crickle with his with the curve. Yeah, he was missing okay. seconds, and he was a dominant stag. Like he was, Jack got him going backwards because we'd hunted him. Like I know four previous years that we were hunting him, 
Yeah, and wow. he was big all of those four years. Yeah. Um, and yeah, so there's quite a few. I'd say we're heading towards probably fifty percent of the stags that we've seen recently are genetically like no seconds at all. Yeah, wow. I'm, I'm um, intrigued in regards to him being the dominant stag. Were you always finding him in roughly the same location when you'd go back each year, or do you change by a bit? He had a pretty big home range, mm-hmm. um, but, but we'd find him every year. Yeah, okay. Kind of thing. And he was holding a lot of hinds all the time. He was so hard to get on to. Like all those years, we didn't know he was genetically missing his seconds, but he was mm. unmistakable. Just he was so round and his yeah. long tops at the back that came to the point where they were only like a couple inches apart. That's crazy. Like, it was, yeah. They're cool, They're cool looking, right? Yeah. 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 Um, so, yeah, this big 4 4 was kind of our target and he was he, he was roaring um a fair bit and there was one morning in particular where he was probably 400 meters three to 400 meters away like directly across on a bench from us and we could see him and he was chasing this hind like hell bent like around in circles they were flat out and he was roaring um and we were like oh they were kind of like moving up because once again it was like mid-morning mm-hmm. and the thermals were at that point where they were starting to sort of change. There was enough sun out that they were starting to drift up, but every now and again they drift down. The wind was just not really good for a stalk in that position. So we were like, the stag was, he was pretty hell-bent on this hind, and you won't draw a stag or a buck away from a hot hind. So our goal was to draw that hind to us, which a lot of cases, the hinds and does were actually more responsive to coming to calls. Doing stag calls or fawn calls so, to get them in? Uh, just hind calls. Hind calls, hind calls to the hinds calls. Yep. would get the hinds in? Yeah. Yep. Oh, wow. Yeah. And the same that's, with does. Um, yeah. That's actually a question I there have. Was, do, you, do you guys hear many hind calls when you're out and about? Yeah. Yep. So I, I posted a video. I'll actually make it a, just a single post by itself. I ended up getting on on my last morning of that week. I went for a hunt by myself and I got on to – a hind and a fawn that were at this dam and this like yearling ended up turning this like dam and this like bit of grassy area into like it's little racetrack. Like it was just That's playing it. around and it was like sprinting down around the dam wall. You could hear it going through the water up onto the dam wall. And she was calling like nonstop and like wow. it was loud. So it was really cool that I got to video that and actually have that. And I had a few people, well, I posted on my story the other day. I had a lot of people actually reply to me and say like, well, my hind call is way off. I've never actually heard it before from an yeah. actual deer. Yeah. Like it's pretty high pitch, right? Way off. I need to get better at that. Yeah. It's kind of the hind. So the hind was feeding only about 50 meters away from it's fawn and it just didn't care about fawn. It knew its fawn was doing the same thing. Yeah. And she was just sort of browsing on bushes and stuff. Eventually this fawn kind of ran off and got over a fence and like over the other side. And this hind kind of got to the point where she's like, oh, like where's my yearling gone? And she went up like looking for her and she gave a few hind calls. Hers was lightly deeper tone, I guess, and not yeah. as loud. Yeah. Um, but this fawn, she was like going hell bent. It was kind of like a, yeah, well, kind of like that. I'd probably not. I'd probably have to watch the video again to get the no, exact. Yeah. I'll, I'll definitely post it up so everyone can see that, and I'll um, tag you in it so you can probably share it as yeah, well. Just so yeah, I will get for sure. This is that. Um, I heard. I heard for the first time fawn calls one over the rut, but I didn't hear any hind calls at all. We were out for the whole week. I mean, yep. we didn't we didn't hang out much during the middle of the day because we're always doing some work for the farmers. But during the mornings, like you hear the stags going crazy, and then that was it. Like never heard any hinds. Yeah, yeah. So hind, I've heard over the years. I've heard hinds every now and again, but not as much as fallow does. Fallow does seem to be a bit more vocal. Mm-hmm. Um. Like the, the good fellow buck ended up getting the drop on. He had a couple of does held up. And in between his grunting, these does were just like, meh, 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 oh, meh, wow. meh, meh, like constant, um, <laughs> but not and as loud. Like fellow does are pretty quiet. Yeah. And you reckon that person. is like chatter between them to say like, we're going this way or something like that? Or like, do you know that? Yeah. Like- I, I, I'm not too sure. Yeah, I just get Dan Flores sort of on hanging around each other in a group, and like the bucks going crazy. They kind of just, yeah, they kind of just talk to each other and and do that, like pretty regularly. Yeah. So, yes, 
that was all, all pretty um pretty cool. So yeah, this four four we kind of set up me and my old man like we we're like oh whichever direction he comes in like either of us is whoever gets a shot go for it yeah. um is going to take him type of thing. We we're both sort of happy to to put him on the ground if we could and um, get a ton of meat from him as well. So we gave some my old man like gave some hind calls because he's a bit better at it than me and next minute we're like looking across and through this like bit of a clearance through the trees we just see this hind just tear straight down towards us like <laughs> down in the gully and this stag like he takes a little bit but he starts like following and then they held up down in the gully for a little while because we were kind of we we're like oh do we need to move, move? like which way they're going to come up type of thing because the wind was starting to sort of turn direction and we were like moving around a little bit and then he give a roar every now and again and every now and again we just give another call and they ended up coming down around straight up below us um which we thought they would like loop around and keep a bit of height they came straight down from below us and she came up around and there's this big tree with all this like eucalyptus like growth at the bottom of it and it was just like a wall and she came up directly behind that and came around and she was at oh, maybe eight ten meters if yeah. that so I'm there and I was already drawn back because I knew I wouldn't be able to draw back with her in sight. So as Definitely. soon as I saw her coming, I was like, yeah, Sag's going to be behind her, which is always the case. Chasing the scent, yeah. Um, so I, I was drawn back and this hind comes up and he stops. He was probably 20 metres behind her and he's like roaring and he's right there and this one big tree is just in the way. Like, <laughs> Isn't that the way? Always the way. <laughs> out of all the things that could happen, like yeah. this, this is how it is. And she ended up, she got to close enough proximity that the wind wasn't firm enough and wasn't great. She kind of sniffed around a little bit and then turned around and got out of there. And yeah. he kind of did the same. He just saw her take off and he followed her. Following. Yeah. Um, yeah, and after that, like... They what a cool experience though, right? Stuff. Like that's why yeah, I love yeah. about the raw and hunting in general. Just you get to see that stuff. You get to go and just be that close to the animals. It's such, it's, yeah, it's such a sick time. Yeah. It's, yeah, it's bloody awesome. And like, man, how cool animals and like red deer, they're big. Like a lot of people don't realize how big a big red stag is in the body. Like they're 250 to 300 kilos, like a real, real big one. It's a big animal. It's like three times the size of a good fallow buck. Dude, yeah, like we're going down to hunt fallow. I'm like, are these goats? Like they're so small in comparison to what I'm used to seeing all the time, <laughs> <Yeah>. right? <laughs> yeah, so like a, a really big fallow buck, you're looking at around sort of 80, 90 kilos, I think. Yeah, that's um, crazy. Big difference, right? Literally 3x. Yeah, big difference. Red deer are like, they're big. Mm -hmm. um, but So yeah, I can't remember whether it was that morning or the next day. I end up, we end up stalking up this gully and we saw a chalky buck up in front of us. Yeah. And there was a red, we... We thought we heard a roar, like, right up at the end and sort of up a little bit. So, like, oh, we'll head up that way. Like, this is a pretty good gully in the past. Like, in this point, fallow. like, if, if it's a buck or a stag, which one are you going for? If you had the, the choice on both, is there is there a preference at that <laughs> point in time or not really? Yeah, so we're always targeting the reds. Yeah, like, okay. we'll walk past a grunt. Like, in saying that, we'd normally try and, like, if we have to go past a buck that's grunting. You want to see it at least. Yeah, try and get eyes on it. Yeah, definitely. Because yep. if, if it ends up being like an absolute monster, like we're going after it. Definitely, yeah. But we're normally targeting the roars um, mm -hmm. and the red deer. So, yeah, yeah, we got stalking out this gully and I see this chalky buck up in front of us um, and he's kind of, I think he was checking a scrape and we caught him at the point where he's kind of like turning and he was like heading back up the gully. And he was like, it was half decent, but... I was kind of like, at that point in time, knowing that there was a red further up, I was kind of like, oh, I'll, I'll pass him up. Like, mm -hmm. he's only going to be bigger next year type thing. Definitely. And we're walking up and he like disappeared like so quick. We're like, he was only walking when I last saw him and we got over there and we're like, we expected to kind of be pushing him along type thing. And yeah, he was nowhere to be seen. So we're like, oh, well, don't know where he went. Kept going and we heard like just two grunts out of the blue, like up to our right like 150 200 meters away hmm. and we're like oh there's buck all the way up there so we're kind of just hanging around like waiting here another roar on this stag to try and like get a better location on him next minute i just hear something coming down from this like through the scrub and i'm like and dad's like over my shoulder and he's like yeah buck buck get an arrow so i like didn't have time to like put my like phone on my boat because i normally like recording my shots and stuff like that definitely 
So I just had time to quickly get an arrow and draw back. And by that point, this buck is charging down his pad through thick scrub, like hell bent straight towards us. So as I got to, as I just reached a full draw, he's like saw me at that last sort of step and just mm-hmm. pulled up at like oh, 12, 10, 12 meters through the scrub. And the whole time he was front on and he had like a nice wide frame and like all his points were good. His um, tray times were kind of like, out from his yep. beams, um, real wide, and I couldn't really tell how like good he was. And I kind of whispered to him, "Oh man, I was like, I shoot him." And, he was like, <laughs> mm-hmm. and then the, yeah, as soon as I, I heard, "Yep," boom, just yeah, fire, <laughs> let it go. Like just could not pass up an opportunity like that. And definitely, yeah, straight straight through the chest, um, and sort of angled down and out near his back leg, and he sort of ran oh, 20, 30 meters around through the scrub, um, and went down, and yeah, he was. Really cool buck, got a heap of really nice meat on him because, yeah, that front on shot collected the juggler and heart and he pretty well, like, bled himself out. Yeah, bled it out for you. How good. So do you yeah. know what caused him to run down towards you guys? Like, do you think he kind of thought <laughs> he was in the buck or something? Or Oh, no <laughs> idea because he – we're nearly certain. He was one we heard two grunts from. And then yeah. after that, he must have something in him. He just turned and was like, I'm headed down. Yeah, wow, that's yeah, crazy. Yeah, we're kind of in the right spot at the right time to have him come straight to us. Yeah. Um, so that all played out pretty quick and unexpected. Um, so, yeah, got a ton of meat off him. And Can you talk pretty... through just real quickly, because you talked about the tines before on the on the yeah. fallow. What's the difference with them? Like, obviously, they've got the paddles at the back, and there's something about the paddle that everyone looks for as well, right? Yeah, the guards is a big – when you're, like, scoring and stuff, the guard time. Um, I'm probably use... Yeah, go for it. Bring him over. Yeah, probably buckle i have got a head right here. So, the fellow buck, they got their brow tines. Yep. Tray tines. They got their you say tar. that's tray straight away? Bow yeah, tray. Yeah, tray. So, brow tray, um, yeah. The, yeah. So, the reds will have their second one here. So, they'll yeah, have bay. brow, bay, tray, tray or yep. bez, trays. Yep. Um, yep. Some people say. Um, and then you got the palm. And this, the lowest time at the back of the palm here, that's what's called their guard time on fallow. Okay. Um, so that's on that's the back at the bottom. Like, just the list yeah, of that's there. a yep. specific time that you score, the same as these here. Um, and okay. then a lot of it goes into like the palm width length and the points yep. um, on the back of the palm and that sort of stuff. But yeah, so the, 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 the points, main... they just all essentially like your, your tops from there. So it's just the, the one at the very bottom is the one that they, they count. Yeah, that guard point. And it's normally specifically longer than all the others. And it's sort of like rough around and it, it's when they're fighting, their heads are right down like that. It actually acts as sort of a guard when yeah, their antlers are gotcha. locked. So, yeah, okay, that's cool. And so, this one that you shot on that day in particular, you said he was, his guards were out to the, the side instead. Um, his his trait is route, and he had pretty for his age, he had pretty good guards. Like all his all his features were were really good. He wasn't missing anything. He wasn't weak on yeah. any particular area. He was yeah, just like a real nice looking buck. Yeah, um, that's incredible. So that pretty much wrapped up my week. There wasn't a whole lot. Like we get on roars every now and again, but it was real hard to lay eyes on stags or get onto them because they were they would roar and then you wouldn't hear anything when you mm-hmm. needed to hear it to locate them. Um, I actually like th- that was something I changed a lot this year when I was out by myself bow hunting. Is that when I was just walking in general, I tried to not necessarily have the bow on my back so much because I knew yep. more opportunities would come up during the rut. Like because they're just they're so sporadic during the rut that I would make sure if I was in like country where I knew that were typically going to be stags, I had a bow, I had an, an arrow knocked, and I was walking along like that just in case because literally it's it stunned me, it stuck, it's got me. I've missed so many opportunities in the past because of not having that. So I'm like, this year, I'm yep. going to make sure I'm ready to rumble. Like at any point in time, if something happens, it's not meant to happen or it doesn't happen normally. And then all of a sudden there's a stag in front of me. Like I want to, I want to capitalize on that opportunity. Um, so that was definitely something I did very different this year. Kind of, it slows things down a little bit as well because you've got obviously a, a knocked arrow, but it's also, then you're not losing. You're not, you're not letting go of anything. That's for sure. <laughs> Not letting yeah. it pass. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, you gotta you gotta be like that. Like, especially in the rut when it's like that. When you're in an area that you know there are like it's a good area, there's gonna be mm-hmm. animals there. Like you have to be ready. Like all your senses are heightened. Like it's a next level of bow hunting. Like not saying pigs and goats and stuff like that are easy, but they're type it's a different game. It is. Yeah, you can kind of like you can locate them and 
plant a stalk type situation. Whereas deer are unpredictable. They're making noise. They're chasing each other around. They're moving mm. stags like satellite stags or other stags are moving from like calls to other calls and they're just everywhere. So yeah, Definitely. you kind of got to be on your, on your game a bit. Yeah. Yeah, hundred percent. No, I, I think it was definitely. Um, <clears throat> I heard a lot of stories of people running into situations like what I had in the past. Um, in the lead up, like, oh man, he, he was right there, and I, I wasn't ready. I'm like, yeah, I've had that before. I'm like, not making not making yeah. that mistake this year. <laughs> uh, and so, what you had to you had to leave after that, pretty much. Yeah. So, um, yeah, one of what yeah, date was that? You said that was the seventh. That was pretty much the Easter weekend then. You're yeah, home. six. I because yeah. I was rostered on um, work day shift Easter weekend, so I yeah. come. Yeah, so I come home that that sixth the evening of the sixth, and yeah, I was straight in the work the following morning. So I had three days, and then only a day and a half off work. Had some stuff to do around home, and then I had two night shifts, and I was like, and then I had like the weekly, and so I kind of get every second weekend I have off, and then I mm-hmm. work um, the ones in between. So I was like, yep, I'll go back up there, mess with my old man. He's like, yep, I'll come back down. We'll get in a final hunt type thing. This was the – so it was Friday the 14th, I believe. Um, I will finished night shift at 7.30 in the morning. Yeah. Drove straight up there, got up there around about 9, 9.30. Um, we sort of did a bit of a morning hunt, got ourselves sort of up to a spot where my old man was going to go for a bit of a – bit of a walk, check one of my cameras while I try to get a little bit of sleep because I haven't slept since 3.30 <laughs> the previous day. All right. You do that too <laughs> often, right? The, the love of hunting just yeah. shines through. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, yeah, I ended, up, I ended up getting like close to an hour nap, um, sort of around 1, 2 o'clock. Had a bit of a feed and then kind of had a bit of an Arvo hunt um, on the 14th. And, yeah, so this fallow buck sparked up we had a hunt on some some boars and some um pigs on the top of the ridge and we saw them from the vehicle so we hadn't we all we had was our bows we yeah. hadn't planned to go on a massive big hunt um it was kind of like yep we'll go over to these pigs check them out go back to the car typically uh, for you at this stage so 14th you're talking about would would you expect there to be deer still making calls and stuff usually in reds would years. normally, yeah, in past years, reds would normally go quiet after that. So that East Long weekend is kind of like the last of it. And then they start to quiet down like around that 7th, 8th, like 6th, 7th, 8th of April type thing. Um, but the fallow normally go for a bit longer. Like they, they normally start in that first week of April and they'll go through to mid, sometimes if you're lucky, late April. Mm-hmm. So I kind of went up just not really – expecting to hear any reds i thought might hear a roar here and there maybe of a stag that had a hind that was in season yeah um but i really just want to go out there try and like locate some fallow try and find a fallow that we hadn't had on camera or laid eyes on because i hadn't really seen or got any on camera that were like really good that i was wanting to chase type thing so Mm -hmm. yeah after after following like some of these pigs and stuff we basically ended up halfway down this steep side and this fellow buck started up and he was right down the bottom and i was like oh we're kind of already halfway down we're already halfway there mm-hmm. i was trying to get eyes on him so to get eyes on this thing he was down in like thick country so we got to vantage points but just couldn't see anything but we could hear him we knew he was there so i was like oh bugger we're gonna run our light here in a little bit we're already halfway down here may as well make a go of it yeah. So got all the way down there. It was late enough. The wind was starting to suck down. So we'd sort of gone straight down from where we were. And he was sort of down to the right in front of us um, on a bit of a bench. He was directly at the bottom. Yeah. He must have like chased a doe down there or something. But he'd worked his way back up onto this bench um, yeah, where it was okay. kind of his yeah. spot where he was hanging. And he's so just he sort of broken down stop, like he's just going, or yeah, is he, he, was going, he was going off. At one point, we thought there were two bucks right there because yeah, wow. our, when his grunts were, and he was he was, must have been moving around a lot because we we honestly going down and we thought there were two like in real close proximity. And once again, this situation like they're going to end up like clashing heads, like definitely. So we were like got down 
it quick, got down around below into the gully and started working up. And as we started working up, he it sounded like he was kind of working up at the same point. So we kind of missed him at the bottom and he was sort of working his way back up. So I cut up this real steep bit of a, a gully and then just punched it straight up towards him, wind it like drifting down in our face and came up under this, I don't know what type of tree it was, but yeah, it just had real nice, it was like an umbrella type thing. Yeah, just awesome. Real dark underneath it, heaps of foliage. So I sort of snuck up behind under that. And on this bench, it was just this long, like, tussock type grass. And it was long. It was like shoulder height. Like this, you uh-huh. barely see this buck's head. And there was like a little bit of gap in between like the clumps of it. And there was this briar bush that there were a couple of days feeding on the bench um, around to the side of us. But they were behind a bit of scrub and stuff. So we weren't too worried. Like we'd be able to get away with a little bit of movement. And he had this one little chocolate dough held up right under the edge of this briar bush. And he was just going mental, just croaking off his head. And he was like doing loops. And when we first come up to the tree, he was on our side. Yeah. In a pretty good, like I had a relatively clear shot. But as soon as like we sort of positioned ourselves and I was like ready because I had to watch the my limb clearance at the top mm-hmm. um, when I made a shot, my limb didn't whack a branch or something. So sort of got myself forward enough under that tree um, that I had clearance and he ended up going around behind this bush and he was behind this bush for like 15 minutes. And I was like, he was only around 17, 18 meters. So I was like knowing like the wind's only drifting slowly, being in close proximity for a long period of time, like your scent disperses yeah, a little bit yeah. in a sense. So I knew like being this close for a long period of time was going to sort of limit my chance of them yeah, like sure, not win this kind of thing. So it was kind of frustrating because every now and again he'd come around but I just could not see enough of his body, even outline or shape to pick my spot and like mm-hmm. know where to put that shot. So yeah, 15, 20 minutes passed and he was like croaking off his head. And this is when um, those does were just like, nip, 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 nip. yeah, wow. So, and I drew back and let down, I think four times. And like, I'm shooting a, a poundage is probably a bit too much. Like I'm planning to <laughs> buy another boat here soon um, with a bit of less poundage, but yeah, because that doe, she was feeding front on behind a bit of grass, but she would have been able to pick out any major movement through that yeah, in the right. shadow. So every time I drew back, I was fine. But letting down, I had to try and like let down like really straight without making any movement. Yeah. And I was like, yeah. I mean, that even with the with the bow that you're – I mean, uh, yeah, even with the bow where you're, you're impounded, you're easy – like finding that easy, that's still a hard thing to do to be like yeah, so like, steady. Yeah, and it's really still. hard to – yeah, yeah. I was that's actually something I've like, practiced a bit, like just in case. I'm like, you know what, this situation is going to come up at some point. I'm going to try practice this, and it's it's tough. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, yeah, I can sit on my ass with my leg straight out in front of me and draw back my butt and let it down, like Definitely. oftentimes with with ease. But yeah, just being in this situation, kind of under this tree and having to draw back um, and let down, like in a straight manner, slowly without mm. making any movement. It, yeah. It, wasn't nice on the shoulder, let's say that. So, <laughs> lucky you go to the gym, at, mate. at this point, yeah. Um, and it was it was starting to get later. Like the light was was dimming, and um, a lot, lot more than what you could see in the video as well. So, I got to the point where I was like, as soon as I can make him out, I'm going to put a shot through this grass. Like I'm shooting a high poundage. I'm confident in my setup. Mm-hmm. Like it won't be enough to deflect my arrow significantly at such a close distance. Yeah. And that, there wasn't enough. Like there was a few like dead thistle type looking things in the way, but I just made sure that I had a clear window pretty much. And he came around and he was, yeah, he was grunting sort of front on and he was turning. He was just moving constantly. So I was like, had the pin on him and he's there moving, grunting and he turns and he gave me a quartering on shot and I just put it sort of, in the just point of his fun. shoulder, yeah. and it just skittled through him like somewhat low, but not too low. And yeah, Luminok, um on the arrow just like whipped straight through him, skipped off to who knows where, and I find that the arrow went a lot further than we thought it would. Yeah, and he kind of just ran like he bucked at the shot, which is always a good sign uh, yeah. for deer. Yeah, and he kind of just trotted over on the bench and then turned, and, like looked back, and then kind of just walked over out of sight and the does like had no idea what was going on. They were still just right there, like looking around like, Oh, what's going on? And I was like, 
Did I hit him too low? Like, just seeing him walk off as if nothing was wrong. I was like, yeah, well, dude, what the hell happened? Heartbreaking. Yeah. Yeah. So I was like, at that point, I was sort of a bit stressed and kind of pushed the doze off down the left and went over. Um, how? how? Uh, just like you walked at them pretty much to get them to move off. Yeah, yeah. That was pretty much straight away. As soon as he went outside, I was like, yeah, I'm following up, watching where he's going. Mm hmm. Um, so I went straight over there. They, they, I can't remember where they barked or not, but at this point, I kind of pushed them off quick enough that they just got out of there. Yeah. And um, I was stalking over, and my old man was like, went over to look where my arrow was. Um, and he sort of had a bit of a different angle, and he like just pointed. He's like whistled at me, and he's like, he's like, he's down there, and he'd gone down. He walked down um into the gully, and which was only really like fifty six meters from the shot, so he hadn't gone far, yeah, okay. and he was yeah. trying to like walk up the other side mm -hmm. but he'd take a couple of steps and he'd be wobbly and he'd be like stepping back on himself yeah, okay. like he, he was in Just trouble walking, like yeah, it, definitely. yeah and i could say at that point i could see so i went in pointed my shoulder and exited back behind the crease about three ribs back which is like if it was the reverse and a quartering away shot like you're always aiming to Wait, hit the yeah, off exactly. side point of that shoulder so it was a pretty well perfect shot i was like man this thing's tough <laughs> so i had another arrow Quickly got a range on him. He sort of turned, gave me broadside shot, and I sent one at about thirty-eight meters, roughly, uh -huh. um, and just pickled him middle of the lungs. He ran up twenty meters and yeah, and bowled over. And yeah, so that first shot, there was nothing wrong with it. I just so was he dropping a lot of blood or anything at that point, like on the first arrow? Yeah, 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 yeah. It was it was a good shot, and he was yeah. I just think do you reckon he would have died anyway? Hormones. Yeah, yeah. Like if he I was give, gone. give him yeah. a little bit of time, he was bugging. Like it, yeah, it was a good shot. It was a hard shot, possibly a bit low, like an inch low, maybe an inch higher. Uh -huh. He might have gone down um, quicker. Yeah. So, but yeah, I just put that second one in him because we're running out of light. Um, yeah, got him down and he was real yeah. nice. Old, like when we first went up there, I think one of the videos you can see me, I like turn. I was like, he, he's, he's a good one. <laughs> yeah. And he just heavy, like he had a somewhat narrow frame. Um, yeah. Yeah, it's this one here. Like, he's one, tipped yeah. in, like a good um people always ask me like how I age deer and bucks. Uh-huh. When their frame and their antlers starts tipping at the top. It looks so sick when they do that. That yeah. is a really good um indication of age because yeah, when okay. they're younger, they'll sort of they'll start out like yeah. the antlers go out, out and sort of straight up, like when they're like a stick head or young, and then they'll start to get a little bit of that rounded shape. Yeah, but they're still sitting straight up, and then yeah, over the yeah. years they slowly sort of get rounded and right tip now. in at the top. So when they're tipping in, and you can see that the tops are curling in, that's a really good indication of age. Um, and I could see that like he's got like he's heavy, he's thick. Like even where he tips in at the top, yeah. they're almost like, like big blades. Definitely. Um, the only thing he's lacking overall is he's fairly narrow and upright. Um, in his frame, but everything else, like he's got real nice palms, guards, all these points. Yeah. So I, I think he's he'd be my second best fellow buck that I've ever shot. I've only shot yeah, one wow. that's um, a bit better than him. So yeah, I was stoked over the moon. Couldn't believe it. Um, my efforts of coming up after night shift and really definitely just putting the hard yards. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, it's putting in the hard yards. I like, really paid off it. Yeah, that was an awesome hunt. Um, the walk out was pretty brutal. Mm -hmm. After dark, not having backpacks, <laughs> water, having to carry everything. You were actually you were telling me a little bit about this, and you guys hadn't had a drink for like multiple hours on this point, right? Yeah, because we when we did decide to go down in this butt, we thought that we were nearly certain that there'd be water in the creek. And if we right. went down a bit further, I think there would have been. But just where I ended up getting up, onto him up on this bench and stuff. We didn't really want to, after I shot him and it went dark and we got photos and stuff and, oh, and duck down push him and up. Duck we didn't really up want to have to go down yeah, and then go definitely. back up. Yeah. So the creeks near you, so, you're just good to drink out of pretty much? Yeah. Most of the, like the flowing water in the creeks is pretty fresh Um, or the springs, spring springs. fed and stuff like, yeah. yeah, it's real clear. Like, yeah, I drink it all the time. Don't really have to worry about That's anything. So just fill your bottle up or something. Just make sure there's not a ton of floaties or anything getting around in there. <laughs> <laughs> <Filled water drink. laughs> I've got cow feces um, filled water. Yeah. I don't don't touch my water. <laughs> yeah, normally um, Hoda was actually I know Hoda carries them a fair bit. Um, just like some aqua tabs or something. And yeah, yeah, I I need to get some more. I think they are fairly essential 
um, yeah, people definitely. like us who get out in those situations because you never know where a hunt's going to lead you and you could end up being out for longer, go further, drink more water, require more water. Definitely. Things like that. So, yeah, if you're in an area and you have the situation, you have a bottle or camel pack on hand and you come across water that isn't in a nice, clear, flowing creek, I'd definitely recommend, like, having some aqua tabs or mm-hmm. something like that and yeah, so definitely. you can get that because, yeah, I can tell you, going without water on a pretty grueling hunt like that. It, it, <laughs> Especially once you've got to do the hard work of actually carrying an animal out. Like, that's just next oh, level. Yeah. yeah. Nothing like yeah. a dry mouth and working hard. That sucks. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, so that was pretty cool hunt. I was, like, stoked with that. Like, that just made my rut, like, that much better. Like, it was such a, like, a really good buck. The best buck I'd seen all rut. And I just Incredible. happened to be this buck that was going nuts this one afternoon. Um, so, yeah, that night we actually camped out of the back of my ute um, over the other side of our place just mainly for the reason so that we could hear if there were any reds making noise yeah. at night um, would give us a bit of like an indication where to go for that morning hunt. So, yeah, we camped out of the back of my ute over the other side of our place and we all night, all we'd heard was two bucks. One was one that my old man and then one of our mates, Michael, they rattled him in in that previous week. Mm-hmm. Um, it, it was a nice buck, but this, once again, sort of on the younger side, like he'll be big next year type thing. Yeah, cool. So we, we knew what he was, and there was another buck that we could actually see from the vehicle. Um, mm-hmm. He was sort of up on the bench above us, and he was a young, chocky fella, like nice shape, just – Thin palms, like barely long, but just thin palms. Yeah. Um, and we could tell he was young. He was holding about 10 does, actually. Um, is that is that a sign of bad genetics or is it just age? They just haven't developed yet. Yeah, that's palm. just age. So yeah. as they age, like if they've got everything and like even if they're clefty, when they're younger, those clefts can actually fill out into full palms. Yeah. Um, I've seen quite a few people like sort of post photos on social media and stuff. And one side's a little bit clefty and they're like, oh, cull buck, like shot him because he's cull buck. And I look at that and I'm like, yeah, that's not the case. Like I've seen, like Just found shit. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Like sometimes they will hold that cleft genetically. Yeah. Sometimes they won't. So the, yeah, when they're young, it's really hard to call something as a Actually put a gauge on it, yeah. When they've got everything else. Like if they're, if they've got a real weak side or it's just – a stick a like or they're yeah. missing points or something like that like yeah 100 percent. that's a, a cull buck yeah um, but if they got all their points and their palms thin or they're a bit clefty on one side that could just be because they're young and in the following years they could um fill that out and become yeah, really nice hey? yeah and so it's an yeah, interesting point that in general they're yeah they're incredible right and there's an interesting point right because it's like for a brand, brand new bow hunter into a space, I'm like, go for it. Go go and get whatever deer you want because really they're oh, yeah. the best species and you could be wiped out tomorrow if the government go and do what they want to do. But at the same yeah, time, at the same time, it's like, hey, if you do want to see the herd grow, you can't always shoot the young ones and expect you expect to get big ones in a few years' time, right? You do need to let some of them grow if you want to, if you want to see the big ones. Yeah, yep, that's it. Yeah, I'd definitely recommend that. Like if you're new to it, um, you haven't hunted deer or like, Take anything you can get a chance at because getting yeah. opportunities on like deer is not easy. Like you sometimes you will get sometimes. lucky and yeah. be in the right spot at the right time and they'll come to you or you call them in or rattle them in. That's probably the best situation. But yeah, it can be really hard at times. And the older they get, the harder they get to definitely get onto them. So yeah, and that, that's another thing. Like the chopper shoots, there was a pretty major chopper shoot um, late February, early March that was in our area. It didn't. It came to it shot one of our neighbors' places, but it was enough to make an impact on the red deer herd. Mm-hmm. And there were two like monster stags that myself and a bloke that hunts that neighboring place. He has cameras out, and we talk between ourselves a fair bit. Um, and yeah, there were two really good stags that we chased in previous years, and they were even bigger again this year. Like we believe that this year was like their peak. Yeah. Um, really good stags and that was kind of getting us excited and then this chop shoot went through and like after that we heard about the numbers of the deer and stuff that they shot and there was rumors getting around that yep they're like the big two big red stags like we'd heard rumors from other people in the area that 
yeah, there were these two big stags and we we're like, yeah, that was the ones that yeah, we were after and then the, the so chopper got them. And yeah. And um, so, cause with the chopper shoots, they have to get essentially, essentially they're meant to get uh, permission from the owners to go and shoot in their block still. Right. Yeah. So they have to, yeah. There's a lot of sort of regulations and stuff from the government side that they have to abide by and stuff. But yeah, the property owners have to allow it to happen. And there were some properties that were in the area of this shoot that denied the chopper shoot. Um, And I did hear um, sort of word from the neighbors, some of the places around us that did allow the chopper to Mm -hmm. come shoot their place. They're like, nah, like not happy with how it went down. Not Not just seeing too many injured animals or? Oh, that as well well as just the waste of deer, especially red deer. Mm -hmm. Because fallow, from what I've heard, fallow are pretty good. When they get a chopper over them, they kind of scatter like roaches and they will get put themselves up in thick scrub out of the way. Whereas red deer, they're bigger, they kind of... They'll herd out and hold up out in the open and they yeah. can get them to like run straight up the fence line or ridge and they're just sitting ducks. Yeah, far out. So, and yeah, I don't know what it is. It seems like the fallow deer population grows quicker than a red deer population. So I don't know whether. Yeah, I wonder if they have the same gestation or what the deal is there. Like, I think, I think their pregnancy, their period of their pregnancy is the same time period because yeah. the. Valadoes and red hinds, they do drop their fawns um, around that November period, from what I know. Yeah. Um, but I just think that I'd have to ask Kevin Shield because he knows, he's a man for knowledge on red deers. Yeah. Um, as far as I know, he he would probably have a pretty good idea. But Yeah, so 230 days for a fallow, uh, and yep. then you've got 236 for a red deer. 290 yeah. per row. That's not important to us. But yeah, so there you go. So pretty much bang on. Yeah, so pretty much the same. The only thing that I could possibly put it down to is that when they do have a fawn, how many years that um, fawn or hind has to mature before they actually yeah, can have point. a baby of their own type thing. Like I don't know whether it's longer for reds and that's why the fallow seem to breed quicker or not. It may not be, but it just seems like the red deer population never grows as quick as what the fallow do. Yeah. So the chopper having put a fair din in the red population around ours was a bit disheartening. Um, and that's why we kind of went into the rut with no high expectations type type of thing for that. So, yeah, that was a bit disappointing. But, yeah, that morning that we camped, I only heard those two fellow bucks were like, right, yeah, we're going to go back up over the top of ridge um, and check over the other side. So we did that. We got up there and we're glassing and there were fellow bucks going off um, down off in the distance and straight down our eyes trying to get a look at them from a, a distance. But there was this one one metal buck that he had, he was going nuts. He was like running off three other spikers or young stags, couldn't quite see at this distance. And he had a mob of up towards 20 chocolate dough just held oh, up yeah. in this tight little corner of this little gully on this open, like on the shaded side. Yeah, this ridge just in this little pocket and he was going absolutely nuts so we were just watching him for a while and then at one point my old man's like oh did you hear that and i was like no nah, what was it and he goes oh i thought i heard like a roar hmm. like over that direction but if i did it was like real distant and i was like oh we'll just just grab your bow just in case we run anything we'll go 100 meters over here and poke our nose over so we did that. We went over there, and as soon as we got over this ridge, like only 150 below us, this stag's like roaring, and he was the one wow. we could hear. But obviously, like because he was tucked away, we could barely hear him from where we were because we weren't that far away. Yep. And it's interesting yeah. how they can throw their voices, right? Yeah, I think if you've got direct line of sight, like there's nothing between you and that stag across the other side of a valley or something, you will hear them like kilometers. Yeah. Okay. Like, you so hear them a long way away. I just actually looked up really quickly for the when fallow start mating compared to the hind, the hind. So the does compared to the hind. So does got sixteen months and hinds don't start for twenty four months. So that's that's the difference, right? Yeah. Okay. So there's another year, I Pretty guess. Much. Yeah. Like pretty well like a full months. season. Yeah. In before between. Go. Before they'll be able to. Yes. Yeah, so that. Yeah. That would make a fair impact when you think about it and the number of growth. Definitely. That's actually pretty cool to know. Um, yeah. Yeah. I was curious on that. I didn't have a definite answer for that. 
But um, you're, you're bang on, right? You had it right as to why it's a big yeah. difference. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah, we got on this stag and threw my knockers off. I was like, yeah, he's pretty good. And once again, he was like missing his seconds. On one side, he had like a little little nub where he's taking a baby. His other side was like a four. He had his brow tray and a four from his other side. He had a crown of three. Mm-hmm. And he had like a bit of mass. He was like a nice, like big into a stag, um, holding those. And they're down below us. And it, it was just that timing that when we got eyes on him, they decided to like cut up this bit of a shoot up this sort of tussock face. And there was a shoot that ran up to like a dam. Mm-hmm. And they were coming up. And uh, my old man, like he had his bow. I didn't bring anything. I had my bino harness. Um, and, that, and that's all I had on me. And I saw that they were coming up the shoot, and I said to my old man, I was like, oh, get around those trees near the dam. And as he started to stalk off, this stag just, like, gets on this hind, and there's just running, chasing it, and they just shoot up. And I shout, I, like, full shout out to him, and I was like, run. Like, you need to run <laughs> to get there in time. So he just takes off around, sort of, like, crouched down, trying to loop around. And then he kind of got to the the furthest tree from the dam, and the hind's already on the dam wall. And this stag, like, I was expecting this stag to come up. Like, we thought they were going to the dam. But this stag goes up on the far side of the dam, up around, like, through the through the tussie grass. And I'm just there watching. I couldn't see them because they were behind, like, the treetop for where I was. And I was watching through my binos. Um, and next week, I just see this arrow go, <laughs> <laughs> and then... The deer's kind of run and this day I walked around and I go over and I was like, oh, did you? Did you? And the old man's like, oh, how far do you reckon that was? And I was like, oh, it looked pretty close from where I was, but it was one of those deceiving things where it was a long shot. It was yeah, like a in between, yeah. sort yeah. of ditch effort. It was a long shot. End up like just going under him. Oh, my God. Um, yeah, but so they <laughs> sort of <clears throat> ran off and stuff. And then only moments later, um, a full velvet, like he was in full hard, nice velvet, young five five, trots up out of the gully and just kind of like follows where they went. And I couldn't believe it because this time of year, really out of season, I posted so on my story was, and full velvet. That's insane. Yeah, so I posted on my story and asked like if anyone knew the reasoning for this. Like I'd love to know. I had a couple of people say that oh, I could be a what they call a cactus buck. So that's when a stag or a buck has damage to their like testicles or they like mm. don't produce don't like their hormones um, yeah 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 um but those kind of deer they never shed their antlers huh. but what happens is they get really thick and i know brad smith shot a chittle stag a uh, thing was a couple of years back and he was a cactus stag and they get all these weird like abnormal bumps and growth and kind yeah. of look like tumors on their antlers um and stuff but this this um, young stag, he was perfectly clean velvet and looked as though he was at enough of an age that he had normal antler cycles. It was just out of season. Like he was in velvet oh, wow. when he should have stripped in like late January, yeah, early yeah, February. Exactly. Type thing. That's, that's and it was, age. yeah, 15th of April and he's just perfectly, and he wasn't like rutting um, either. Like he had a thin neck, just, yeah, but was just trailing other deer, obviously, um, following crazy. all the other deer around. And, I had a couple of people say that, yeah, I was right in the fact that he was just out of season, like a hind must have cycled in like late winter and got made with. So he was basically born four months later. And oh, just, you. Yeah, wow. He was kind of just out of that same um, yearly cycle. <laughs> um, and they kind of said that as he ages year and year out, they – he'll kind of transition into in. yeah. Yeah. coming back into the same um, season and, and timing as the others. But someone got back to me only the other day and said that they'd seen and heard of this happen in New Zealand. And apparently if as a fawn, they become orphaned and doesn't have the mother to guide them on where and what to feed on, it kind of throws them out of whack huh. and it kind of like stunts their growth, I guess. Yeah. Um. So that, that could be the other reason behind it, but yeah, it was wow. really cool to see. Really odd, like uh, it'll be cool to see whether he actually hangs around and I get him on any cameras or anything, and whether he's back next year and it's the same situation. So yeah, yeah that's that was interesting. That it's was a bit um, out of the ordinary. We actually had a so we had ridgebacks growing up, and my dad would buy. My dad was a vet, and he had these like it was a great bloodline that he worked with. Essentially, like the owners owners of the veterinary surgery 
had this great bloodline of um, dogs and essentially they would have it every once in a while where a pup would get born and one of the testicles yeah. wouldn't drop and it would create the same sort of hormone disruption to the dog essentially. And so we end up having one of those dogs because we've got it castrated anyway, but um, yeah, yeah, essentially he was never going to grow to full, full height or like full size of what a, a good Ridgeback should be. So essentially they would, they would dud dogs to these people, which is insane because they're just going for yeah. the bloodline and make him look incredible. We end up having this awesome Ridgeback for, for our life sort of thing or uh, well, for his life. But yeah, just crazy. And so I wonder if it's kind of a similar thing as well there where like the testicles essentially don't drop. And so therefore the, the testosterone and whatever else they need to grow and do their thing just doesn't kick into play. Yeah. Yeah. It, was, it could be same, any same or all of those reasons. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. yeah. So yeah, that was just, yeah, it took me <laughs> out of like, wood, man. Oh, I saw that and I was just like, wow, Undone. that is like really cool. Like if I had had my bow, I would possibly try to make a move on him because <laughs> I've always wanted like a hard, like shoot a deer oh, in velvet. I've never shot a deer yeah. in velvet. Yeah. Um, and yeah, that's definitely on on my list of goals for the, the coming years and stuff. Uh-huh. Um, try and get a, a velvet buck or a stag. The stag's are really hard to find in velvet. So a velvet red stag would just be incredible. Um, definitely. But yeah, after that, by the time all that sort of unfolded, it was really cool just to get on reds sort of that late and they're still roaring and stuff. So at this point, it was about 11.30 um, in the morning. So it was starting to warm up a bit. Not much doing, like all the fallow had started to quiet down that we were hearing earlier on. And I was like, oh, we'll just go back down, um, not far from where we camped that night. And I'll check like some of the cameras on my dam over there and see what's been getting around the past sort of week that I haven't been here. Mm-hmm. So I went down there and checked the camera, like check one camera, um, and there was a few sort of pigs and all those ton of roos and young bucks and young stags sort of wander through and stuff. And I checked the camera because it's a pretty big dam, so I've got one on either side of it. Yeah. And the one on the other side, I'm, I'm sitting there checking the camera. And I whistled out to me, oh, man, I was like, you would not believe what is on this camera. And he's like, oh, boy, what is it? Don't no, tell me. And comes over and this big heavy stag is on this camera at 9 30 while we're up the top of the ridge on uh, these other reds yeah. he was there you can hear him all night but he was just there photos of him right in front of my car- camera following one hind he's roaring in front of my camera like 9 30 that morning hung around at the dam for about 15 20 minutes and then um left the camera and i was like oh you're joking like this day didn't make a noise all night and that's why we sort of like left and went off to a different area, like we would have heard him if he was here last night. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I couldn't couldn't believe that one. And then as um, because we were hanging around there for a bit, and my vehicle was just parked on the damn wall, and we we're kind of just trying to kill a bit of time throughout the middle of the day. And yeah, as I'm putting the SD card and changing the batteries in the camera, we were all only like a hundred meters from us, and I was like get stuff like if that is not him like mm, yeah there's a very high chance that this it's is him. Gonna like, be him it's, definitely he was here three hours ago like <laughs> hot, very high chance it could be him so yeah quickly duck back randomly grab my bow backpack and were you packing up to go home well i was heading home we were heading home that night but we were gonna hang around and do an arvo hunt yeah okay yeah um so yeah kind of had everything with you grab my bow and backpack and so my old man and the only really play that we had on him because the dam was sort of at the bottom and then there's a big like behind the dam there's this big like valley that goes a long way up and then it kind of has all these shoots off to like one side these little finger gullies mm-hmm. um and all these like little ridges and he was up like, the first one that has like a little bit of like a creek line that feeds into the top corner of this dam um, where I had the camera and he was sort of up there to the left, like up on a bench. So the way the wind was going, it was like we pretty much had to be on the complete above them on the other side to get the wind even somewhat right. So yeah. we were kind of like when we were at the dam, every now and again, it was sucking down this this little bit of a gully. So we're like, oh, we'll just stay in the guts of the gully and hope that even if it is drifting up, it's going up the other side, mm-hmm. which is normally – where it does go when the sun's up um, because it's like the middle of the day at this point. And he's given a roar like every now and again. And we're like, oh, cool that he kind of sparked up in the middle of the day like this. 
And yeah, we start making our way up there and the wind is like, like not ideal, but it's only going slow. So we're keeping a bit of pace, trying to keep essentially ahead of our scent, I guess. Uh -huh. um, and get to a point where he's sort of up to our left and the wind's like not ideal. And then straight up sort of around from him, I look up and there's this young stag, like pretty young, mm -hmm. like he was not very long, didn't really pay attention to how many points he had, but you can just tell he was a young stag and he was standing right next to a hind. Hmm. And they'd like seen us walking. They kind of saw me as I saw them type thing, probably 80 metres away. And the stag, say it was roaring, roared, and he was around from them. So I knew that wasn't him. So mm -hmm. I kind of, knowing the wind direction, I pushed them off yeah. to like get them out of there because they were like away from the stag and they just turned and, ran straight sort of up through the scrub out of sight. Yeah. And I was like, my only chance here is to punch it straight up. I mean, wind's up mass, just punch it straight up underneath him as fast as I can. Like, I know I'll be making a bit of noise, but in the rut, sometimes you can get away with a bit of breaking right sticks, thing. pushing through scrub yeah. type of thing, especially yeah. if you make some calls, they will just assume that's the other deer coming to them. Uh -huh. So in certain situations, you can get away with a little bit um, of noise and movement and stuff like that. Definitely. So I get up there to his bench and I can see fresh tracks. So I can see um, that's exactly where he was, dead quiet, no stag. And I was like, nah, we got to him, like blowing him out all over. Um, so that was kind of frustrating because the wind had been terrible for the Reds like the entire time. Yeah. And so we, we just sat down for like, I would just sit down and like just listen, like, mm -hmm have a rest before we head back down to the down to the dam and 15 minutes passed i'd say and then we hear a roar and the 80 meters ran from us no way at our yeah. height yeah and i'm like oh like he obviously has a wind in the saw like blown out so i start just quickly get up start stalking around um through the scrub and i get to a point where i thought i'd be able to see him and hear a roar and he's directly below us down where we come from pretty much <laughs> So he's sort of done a loop up around and then back down and we kind of just circled around each other kind of thing. <laughs> and then he's down below us and we could hear him. He was right there. But for some reason, Reds just have, they just especially blend in our place in the country, they just have a way of like moving through scrub just in that section that you, you, they're out of sight. Definitely. Yeah. There was one so point. Still this, at this point. There was one point of this, right? Literally, we're looking over this face of a bowl and yes. I'm like, they're, they're, I'm, I'm sure they're here. They're here somewhere. And then we hear a roar and we still cannot see them. We're literally above them, like 50, <laughs> 50 to 60 meters away from them. We hear this roaring, just looking in this valley. I'm like, I cannot see them for the life of me. And eventually yep. he does another roar, but this time he, he's like, and moves his head and we catch his head. And it was like, yep. he literally just blended in with the sticks and stuff. It was crazy. Yeah, it's unreal how such a large body colored like yeah. red animal can hide so much baffles me um, all the time <laughs> yeah. so at this point we still hadn't even like got eyes on this stag so we didn't yeah. know whether it was this big one or not um but it was sort of the same general area that we'd last left that that we last knew that big four four that we were chasing the yeah, weeks prior okay, cool. um we was hanging so we were kind of like oh could be either of these two um mm -hmm. at this point and so yeah he was below us so i started heading down towards him and at this point we're finally above him we've circled around each other so the wind's pretty good like i don't really have to worry about the wind too much at this point Definitely. yeah the only thing we were worried about is if he's going to follow that pad straight back down where we walked up he would catch our scent where we walked across our scent line like we would have brushed past grass like mm -hmm. bush something and that'll be the reason that it'll do us in and I start stalking down and I hear another roar and he's further down the gully and I heard a third look roar and I'm like that sounds like he's all the way back down at the dam where we started. Yeah. So get back up on the bench and cut around on this bench. So I'm above him and start talking straight down above the dam. And I can see the dam. I can see my ute parked on the other side of the dam. So we never do the scrub and he roars and he's like on this side of the dam, just above where my camera is roaring, like just above the dam. And I just saw that he was like heavy as anything and old. And I was like, yeah, this is the one that was on camera this morning. And I think I'd pushed out that young stag in his hind. So he was kind of looking for his hind. Got you, yeah. I, I get down through the scrub enough um, 
to get a clear shot. And I'm kind of at the point where I've got nothing left. It's just open, grassy ground between me and him. So I ranged him. He was at 62 metres. Mm-hmm. And I was like, I'm pretty confident. Like, I'm a good shot. I'm confident with my setup. Like, I know on a big animal, um, I could, like, pull off this shot. Yeah. So if he were to have stopped in a completely clear lane and I drew back and I was going to decide, like, once I draw back and came to full draw and had the pin on him, I would decide, like, whether I was rock solid on him or whether I felt like it, wasn't gonna it was going to happen or not. Um, but I drew back and he was just walking. And so I was like, oh, damn it. So I give up line call. And my old man was up above me on that bench and he continued further around and was kind of like doing a loop further around on me because we didn't think like this stag would backtrack. Yeah, yeah. So we thought he was going to like do a loop around and we'd be able to call him around. So I, even I thought my old man was a better chance than me like getting in the position where he was headed. Yeah. And he heard me hind call and must have assumed I was trying to call this stag up to me. So he was back behind me in perfect position and he started hind calling and gave like a few roars and stuff. Yeah. And this stag was just oblivious. <laughs> he was not paying attention. I, he's, he's only at like 60, 65 metres at this point. And he's not even paying attention. He's just, just like walking, giving a roar every now and again. And I'm just there. And I'd give some, I end up like letting down at this point because he's gone around a bit further, buying some scrub. And I let out some hind calls like as loud as I could, yeah. just trying to get this thing to like look at me and like just acknowledge that I'm there. <laughs> and I think I did like five and like the first time like he looked but he looked back behind himself and he wasn't looking in the right direction was it like real windy or anything nah Ah, nah that's so hard nah yeah I was like what the hell like this old bastard is just running his own race just (laughs) doing his own thing and he's just not responding and just going where he wants and I got one that it was loud as anything he was half looking in my direction I did it so loud and he he heard me and he looked straight to where I was and then turned his head back and continued walking on his path. And I was like, you are <laughs> kidding me right now. And he went across and I was like, God, he's going back up the way he comes. So at this point, I was like, "I the only play that I have to get a shot at this thing is to cut him off. And I need to get myself in a position in front of him and pretty much just stalk him mm-hmm. at this point because he's not yeah. responding to calls. He's going where he wants to go. I have to get in front of him. So I turn around and like just lay it like I'm sprinting. As soon as he was out of sight, I like sprinted straight back up, dropped my pack because it was slowing me down too much. I'm out of breath at this point. Get back up onto that bench and run around to a pad that I took note of when I came around. The cut down at sort of 45 degree angle down towards the gully, mm-hmm. like down into the creek through this scrub. And it was kind of like a bit of a windy pad, but it was well used. Yeah. Um, so I thought I was going to be able to use that to get down and head him off, kind of thing. And I got to that, and about I was about halfway down, and looked down at my right, and I just see these antler tips, and then it gives like a low bit of a moan, and I was like, too slow. Like I was as fast as I could be. Like I was struggling to break. That's hard, bro. I had to like push myself so hard to get in front of him, and he like beat me to this point. So I held up there and I was kind of just quiet to begin with um, because I didn't really know where he was going. He seemed to kind of held up Um, and it was thick as anything. Like I could only see bits of his antlers when he was like turning his head, making movement. Other than that, like I could not see his head, body, anything. He was probably only like 35, 40 metres away at this point. So I gave like I give a hind call or two because I thought hopefully I can draw him up this pad. So like I gave two hind calls and – I could see his antlers turned, so I assumed he was, like, looking up towards me. Mm-hmm. And then he just, like, wasn't really doing anything. And then at one point I saw him, he, like, just started to walk away. Like, and I was like, you have got to be kidding me. Like, what's the go with this thing? Like, he's obviously lost and looking behind. Like, why isn't he coming to my hind calls? And so I gave, like, another one really loud, and he turned and he looked, and then I, I lost sight of him. And then I was like, kind of set myself up as if he was going to come up. So the pad was relatively narrow and I knew I had to get myself, I didn't want to block the view. If he was to come up, the moment he'd poke his nose and head like around the corner of this pad, he would see just this object or thing just blocking the path and he would mm-hmm. just see that and turn around the bowl before I could even like get a get shot it. at his vitals. Yeah. So I could, I crouched right down 
and tuck myself into the side of the hill, like in these like dead thistles, and try to get myself sort of off the pad, um, yeah, just so I wasn't yeah. blocking that that path. Yeah, and I was just quiet, and I was just sitting there like ready. And then I, I could hear him breathing and it sounded like he was sniffing. Like he must have had his head down on this game trail and he was like sniffing because I heard like two big inhales and then I heard him exhale. And I was like, oh shit, like this thing close as like he's coming. Yeah, no. So I could hear him. Now I could hear him like walk and I could, I could just hear that he was coming. So I drew back in anticipation and he ends up coming up around the corner of this thing. And I'm like holding my pin right on the edge of this bush because being that close, like especially with deer, like they'll – You'll see their head and they'll poke their head around. They can see you directly. Exactly. But yep. you won't get a clear shot of their body um, before they just turn and they're out of there. 100%. So yep. wind was still like slowly drifting up at this point. Not that I really cared anymore because we circled around each other so many times. I don't, don't know how he like, he would have had to cross our scent at some point, <laughs> which was rather odd. Yeah. <laughs> he came around. I was at full draw, holding my pin right on the edge of that scrub. So the moment on the, I was playing the, on the walk, basically get shot into him before he even saw that I was there. Yeah, well. So I'm holding, he comes around the bush and he kind of like lowers his head and his face is just completely covering his chest and everything. And I'm like, in my head, it, like watching the footage back, this all happened in like, like a second, but it yeah. felt like it was like so 10 long. seconds. I felt uh-huh. like he came around that bush walking in slow-mo and his head was down, covered his chest. And I remember thinking like, you've got to be kidding me. Like <laughs> he like glances up and he looks and he's in this position and turned around and bolts before I can get a shot. I'm going to be like pissed. Like yeah. I've busted myself to like play in this stalk and get myself in this position finally and have him like come up towards me. So he comes around this bush. He lifts his head just enough to give me a clear shot. And I sent one down into his chest at like six, all of six meters. No way. Um, That's incredible. Yeah. So he went down, sent a chest and ended up that it exit. Like he kind of was slightly quartering and like turned the moment that I like shot he turned yeah and it sort of exited like back behind his his crease there like in his ribs and he just turned and just barreled through the thick of the scrub and yeah all his craps and stuff so i just instantly like got up ran forward on the pad quickly like snatched my arrow out of out of the dirt um and it was coated in blood and i went ran down on the pad and like i couldn't hear anything and I could just see like a bit of orange through the scrub and he was standing down in the creek and I could literally hear like the blood pouring out on the rocks or something. That's and I was insane. like, oh, yeah, yeah, like, yeah, that was a good shot. He's going down. Like I couldn't believe it. And I just seen like just walk across and just start walking straight oh, uphill up the other side of this gully through the scrub. <laughs> that is heartbreaking. I, I put the binos up and there's just blood hosing out of him, like unbelievable. What? And I was like, you're joking. Like how is this thing still like walking uphill? So – at this point, I kind of like all the adrenaline and I was already like still out of breath. My heart rate was up and I was like, like, no, nah, I have to like get onto him. I have to like watch where he's at. He's up trailing. So I go straight away, start going down and the blood is just like, like you get your garden hose, turn on full ball and just walk across the ground with it. That is how much blood is like that pouring is intense. out. intense, yeah. So I could just see this painted red trail like exactly where he walked all up. How, how long do you reckon this has been, like, that he's pouring out like that? From the shot, it, uh, probably under a minute still. Like, it hadn't yeah, been long. Yeah. Like, all this happened pretty fast. Definitely. So, yeah, I go down. I've got, like, another arrow. Um, and have you been stealthy at this point? Or you're like, I'm just hammering to get this guy? Somewhat stealthy because you don't want to be too loud that you yeah. really spook them. Mm-hmm. Like, if there's a wounded animal or something, like, if they're feeling it, they'll slow down and you'll be yeah. able to catch up to them. But if they win you or well, normally in my situation, if they win you or you, they see you and know that, yep, that's hundred percent. Like that's danger. They'll get a second win and their adrenaline will kick in okay. in that yeah. like fight or flight response. And now they'll, they'll go. just get that surge of energy um, and just go. And normally that's at that point, that's normally the time when you do end up like losing track of them and mm-hmm. can't find them, that sort of thing. So I was pushing pretty fast, but I kind of I knew in my mind that he was losing so much blood that I'd got him. Yeah. But then I still had that sense of like, I want to see get him, him walking up a hill like that. Be, like, yeah, yeah. I want to be ethical. I wanted him to go 100%. down. Like, so, yeah, I pushed myself and to the point where I was nearly at the top and it was pretty steep. 
to the point where I had to make myself stop and just breathe for 30 seconds because I was like nearly like about to pass out. Like I'd push uh-huh. myself, like I'm not even about breathing. Like I was just pushing myself up here so hard and yeah, eventually get up there and he's bedded directly ass on like on this bench mm-hmm. out of the top. And I could see like he, his head was like starting to sway a little yeah, bit. Got you. Yeah. Um, like he was bleeding out a lot. But I'm always one like if you get, whether it's needed or not, you get the opportunity it's for a second more shot. Ethical. Goes for it. Definitely. Yeah. 100%. 100%. Like, if you get that chance, like, it's better than you having a chance and you don't take it, thinking that that first shot mm-hmm. is 100% on the money, and then you lose track of them or can't find them. You'll be kicking yourself that you didn't take oh, that forever. second chance. Yeah, definitely. Like, everyone always, always strives for that one shot one kill down in a matter of seconds doesn't go 30 meters that's like thing. the picture book right what we all want yeah, to happen yeah. it doesn't always happen it's right? yeah that's it so yeah it, there's no shame in like taking a second opportunity Definitely that second not. at all so i'd recommend it for everyone out there like if you get that chance take it so i sort of had that in my mind so i drew back had to sort of get an angle on him um to clear his hip so i Put a second shot through him over his hip, sort of back behind his, um, in his paunch there behind his ribs, and it exited out the front of his chest somewhere. He yeah, managed wow. to get back up on his feet, and what a take! <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I couldn't believe like this thing was tough, and yeah, he was sort of like trying to stay on his feet for a, a little bit, but yeah, ended up just passing out. And the moment that he hit the ground, he was out. Like he would lost all his blood. He was hard and lung taken out, and. Yeah, I, at this point, I was just like, could not believe the situation and that this stag had shown up. Like, we hadn't seen him on any cameras earlier in the rut. This was mm-hmm. the first morning that we'd even seen anything of him. And the <laughs> fact that he was still in that area, sparked up roar in the middle of the day. I managed to, like, make a move on him and put myself in that situation and eventually kind of outsmart him, I guess. Yeah. And, yeah, get him down and, yeah, walking over to him. Like, just how old and heavy he was. He was all, like, had scars all over him. The bridge of his nose was actually dented, and I'm not sure whether that had affected his sense of smell, Breathing, possibly. Yeah, interesting, yeah. Just because, yeah. Apparently he's hearing, too. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, so his skull um, is actually behind me here. You can see in the nose, like, the bone is actually dented. I think it was, wasn't this year. I think it was from the past. Yeah, wow. Um, but... He had heaps of, like, he had um, wound above his eye. You could feel, like, the bridge of his nose. He had a crack in the bridge of his nose. His neck, he had scars. Like, he kind of looked like a rooster. Like, if you look at rooster yeah, stays, wow. they normally, they fight a lot. They got scars, missing hair. He was mm-hmm. kind of like that. And when we ended up caping him, we found antler punctures. All his shoulders and skin was all bloodied and bruised. Um, oh, yeah. fighting. And even caping his face, like, around his face, it was, like, all swollen and, like, like had like pus nodules and like no this way. thing was like an absolute warrior proper um, battler yeah that's insane yeah it was yeah it was unbelievable and yeah just how heavy he's actually wider than he was long um and yeah super heavy super old and yeah. we actually had we got this stag on camera last year and the same thing happened he kind of turned up late rut and that's last year on the camera we picked him as being old and going backwards already. Uh-huh. Um, and this year he was, his seconds were slightly shorter. Um, mm-hmm. He had a bit more mass, but his tops this year were actually a bit better and a bit longer because he was a five, six um, last year on camera. And this year he was a six, seven. So yeah, that's interesting. That's really interesting. So you reckon he was still, uh, still getting older then? He's still yeah, not he's at still, his peak. He's still getting older. Uh, um, I believe if he'd lived like his going off his teeth, like his teeth were worn down um, quite a bit. Yeah. So, yeah, he had a lot of age. His coronets, it was really hard to get the cape out from under his um, coronets. Like, yeah, he screwed by up just because his coronets were right down on his head. And yeah, that just made me up. Sorry, I got a few messages coming through. Yeah. Right. Um, but yeah, I just couldn't believe it and my old man like he was like bloody hell like i can't believe you managed to oh, make that happen like yeah, definitely yeah he even said to me he's like i don't know whether i could have been able to like physically put myself in that position like 
I mean, for you to almost pass out is obviously putting yourself to an <laughs> yeah, extreme like, stand, I, I right? Just, I'd push myself like practically to my limit um, mm-hmm. to get in on him and make, make my move like that. So, yeah, and that just like topped off my right. Like I couldn't believe it. Like going into it without any high expectations, wanting to get um, my mate on the reds more than myself. And then I ended up sort of late, what I would consider late rut. Yeah. Um, getting the drop on such an old stag. It was, yeah, it was bloody awesome. Dude, that's incredible. Yeah, I, I honestly, I was starting to think, where can I get an extra day in for this rut? Like, I just wanted to get back out. Yeah. It was not going to happen. But I, I heard a lot of stories in the same situation of uh, people who went back out for their second second little shootout like that and then got, yep. got it done in the big red stag especially. Yeah, that's awesome. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Dude, that's so cool. That's actually that's that's an incredible story, dude. Like that was awesome. I was on the edge of my seat the whole time, all I'm standing, but I was like, yeah, that was that was sick to hear. <laughs> what yeah, else? Definitely one that yeah, that's up there with like that's a standout um for me. Just the way the hunt went down. Like the wind wasn't like in my favor. It wasn't mm-hmm. the sort of unexpected just happened out of the blue. Kind of just had to make the most of that moment, um, and where I was at that time. And I think that that in itself is such a good lesson, right? Like the we're always going to fight against the winds. It's just what we have to do as bow hunters. So it's like yeah. make happen what you can, and just see what happens of it, right? You, you're going to be no worse off for giving it a shot at least. Yeah, that's it. Especially yeah. like it's all like you're always learning from yourself and mm-hmm. um, the decisions you make, and sometimes like you find yourself in situations where it's like, do I don't I? Mm-hmm. And it's like, well, at the end of the day, like, what do you have to lose? Like, you either try and put yourself in a situation where you will get an opportunity or you just back out. And in some instances, if you know that, that it's like a fallow buck on a stand of scrapes, you know he'll be back the next morning yeah. in that same spot. And it will be beneficial to back out and definitely come Give back when the winds are better or you've got a better stalk on him. Um, but sometimes, like, in the situation I was, when the wind last was up, afternoon, last, you was up gotta make it work. Yeah, last yeah. day, you just got to take your shot. Like the worst that yep. can happen, you, you spook them, they see you, when you blow them out, you don't get them. Mm-hmm. But it's either that or, or nothing. So, yeah, exactly. Yeah, you just got to take that chance. It's all. Bow hunting is about it's taking opportunities, time. right? It really like is. It. Oh, yeah, 100%. Dude, yeah, that's incredible. Well, thank you for sharing, bro. I appreciate it. I know everyone else is going to appreciate it. <laughs> <No worries, too. laughs> Let's um, yeah, let's no, really I'll quickly dr- let's drop your Instagram handle here. I know we're going to keep going, but just so everyone's got it, it's Liam underscore Bowhunter. Um, but in case yeah. I split this into two, still undecided. But <laughs> sorry, what were you, <laughs> you you were going to say something? I cut you off. Oh yeah, I just like love sharing like my hunts. Um, and one of the reasons why I do like posting up Instagram stories, and I was a bit like a just didn't really have time to be posting on socials um, throughout that rough period and while it came later. And I kind of put a reel together of the highlights and post that. And I had like, I don't even know how many, a lot of people messaging me like, oh, dude, like where's your stories? You're known for your hunting stories. Like they're absolutely incredible. Like we love it. Like you've got to share that. Um, so yeah, the other day I put in like a bit of time and post up. I think I maxed out the amount of Instagram <laughs> stories you can post yeah. up. Yeah. <laughs> um, and yeah, just put on like that hunt timeline that I just um, ran through there and all the videos and everything that I captured and stuff. And I really like, like when, even when I'm watching other people's socials and Instagram stories, when I like after work, or when I can't be out hunting and other people are like, I love living that boat hunting through them, hearing their stories, seeing, Definitely. getting out, like seeing animals. Um, so when I'm out, I really try and capture like the shots, like videoing the animals, um, Explaining sort of how the hunt goes, how the store goes. Um, Definitely. Either for educational purposes or just for the entertainment of others. So Bro, I looked over, up, I looked over, sorry to interrupt, but looked over how yeah. much content I put up over that rut period. And over that week, I put out over an hour and a half of stories. It's crazy, right? You're yeah. Like, holy yeah. shit. Like it just happened so quickly. And for me, it didn't feel like anything because you're just doing bit by bit every day. But when I looked yeah. at it as a whole piece, I'm like, holy heck. And there was a few people that told me, like, I watched every single story you put up. I'm like, wow, that's yeah. intense. Yeah. Like, you yeah, hung no, out with me for an hour and a half. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So, yeah, I know how much I enjoy um, that when I can't be out hunting and seeing other people out hunting and seeing their success and stories and stuff. Like, mm-hmm. yeah, I find a lot of enjoyment out of that just because I love bow hunting so much and yeah, so passionate about it. So, 
to be able to do that and get like such a response about it and allowing to share that with people and them enjoy it and sort of have comments or feedback or mm -hmm. things like that. No, it's, it's really cool. So oh, yeah, that's why I really enjoy it. Yeah, this is kind of the first, like I've definitely almost guided people because I've gone to the block with them and guide them on to animals. But this is the first time I've taken a brand new hunter out. Um, I actually was talking with Scotty the other day and he's like, that was the first animal I'd ever shot at that stag that he missed with the rifle. I'm like, fucking hell, dude. Like you did so well <laughs> to even even take a shot, right? But then to actually get down oh, yeah. behind, like we went, we went and did all that, that extra hard work of making sure that he was shooting correctly, like really confident in his shot. And then when he got the hind down the last day, like it just made it, I, I love the whole experience anyway, but it just made it so much more yeah. rewarding when I heard it like that. I'm like, literally the first animal he ever shot was a, was a red deer. Like that's insane to me. I'm just like, <laughs> yeah, absolutely. I remember shooting rabbits with a 22 back in the day. And that kind of was yeah. something that I had on the back of me, but to come in, especially like he's he's um, 40 now. So to come in and shoot an animal at 40 and be able to go home and take that to your family, feed that to the family for months on end, they, they, he's got a, he's like big into his um, smoking. So he did, he oh, did yeah. smoke up with the back straps and they were just like all drooling over how good it was. I'm like, you guys are in for a treat with what you've got to come. Like, yeah, it's a yeah, very absolutely. rewarding feeling after the fact. And I think um, like, uh, obviously I was in the right and I'm like, oh, I want to get my part done. But at the same time, I was so stoked to be able to give that as an experience. And he's like, so can I come down for the next ride? I'm like, dude, why bother waiting that long? Like get down sooner. Let's, let's go hunting again. Yeah. <laughs> yep. Yeah. No, that's awesome, man. Yeah, it's pretty cool. But yeah, I, I understand. And it's funny because you hear it all the time, right? People are like, oh, I get just as much joy out of getting someone else onto something. And yeah, yeah I'm starting yep. to get into that, that side of it now. I'm like, oh, wow, that is, that is really cool. Yeah, no, it's really cool to share those experiences um, with other people. And I'm like to the point now where like I've done a fair bit of solo hunting mm -hmm. and like I still do it because I love it and I love getting out there. But I definitely do prefer those situations when either like, my missus is tagging along with me or just having mm -hmm. somebody else there to share that experience with. It just Definitely. makes it a whole lot more sort of meaningful and enjoyable. And like when I go out and do it by myself, like in that moment, like you get that adrenaline rush, you get that overwhelming like emotions and stuff like that. But after that, like I'm always like, cannot wait to get back and like share a story, like with my missus, with my old uh -huh. man, with my hunting mates. Yeah. And like when they're out hunting, like, always flicking them a message like how'd you go this morning like you got anything yet like mm -hmm. yeah yeah definitely so, actually um yeah. you know you know oh a lot of a lot of kids for instance so i've got two daughters and they'll they'll often be like hey dad can you tell us a story i always tell them my hunting yeah. stories so i'm like all right <laughs> this is a story about maddie a bow hunter <laughs> and, <laughs> yeah that's i'm just saying that's gonna be me yep. yeah yeah <laughs> it's so good <laughs> <laughs> well, um, as a next part to this, what we actually want to do, I've put together a little document with a whole heap of different animals standing in different locations. I just need to actually find it. It's on this one here. Um, and what we've got is a little X that we're going to do to mark the spot. So you got you got proper view of this, don't you, Liam? You can see. Yes, it. I can see your screen. Yep. Cool. We're going to do um, nice and small X because really that's how bigger an arrow shot's going to be. Something nice and small like that. So. First one we've got is a few different goats. I'm going to come on C and V that a few times. There we go. So we've got a few different ones that we're working on. So we've got four different goats taking a drink of water. Let's work on this white little <coughs> white little one here. So if you think about your bone positioning, comes up, across, and then ducks back, essentially, is the way that that front leg is going to work. Can you see my arrow? Yes, I can. Yep. Yeah, yeah, cool. Um, and so as a shot for this guy in particular, you think about he is really, he's covering his vitals pretty darn well in that position. Yeah. Yeah. Right? So for the majority of that, yeah, especially if you're new to it. Actually, um, let's, let's, let's put a pause. Yeah, this is a good point. So as a, as a precursor, we're going to talk about shots. We're not necessarily saying these are the best shots to always take. We're saying this would be a kill shot potentially in this situation, but really you're always best, especially as a start, a starting bow hunter, to wait for your broadhead broadside shot. Like that's going to be the ideal position. We've got a few of those that we're going to talk about as, as we go through this. But I think realistically, like this is like, okay, yes, this would be a shot that potentially would work. And as you get more direct with your shooting, then yes, this would be a great shot for you to potentially take. Um, we're not going to say, like I'm going to say, let's put a shot on every single animal, even though some of these photos are probably, so, probably shots that we wouldn't actually take um in the wild i think that's really good to preference and also i'm going to say that none of these photos are mine i've just got them straight from google so yeah 
Yep. <laughs> yeah, so all, all these shots and stuff, um, I'll kind of explain, like, definitely relative on your experience, your confidence, and mm-hmm. your setup. What pen are you shooting? Definitely. What broad heads you're using? Um, that will really dictate a lot on sort of penetration and change the outcome of situations where you could potentially hit bone or you do hit bone. Mm-hmm. Um, so most shots like the rib cage pretty well covers around the majority of the, well, has the chest cavity. Um, so all shots you will definitely have even a clean broadside shot. You pretty well have a really high chance of hitting mm-hmm. rib. Yeah, but rib bones, they are thinner. Um mm-hmm. Most relatively heavy pounds with a decent um, solid broad head will crack, break, cut through um, and make it through that rib cage. The main bone structure you do need to worry about is the scapula mm-hmm. um, and that bone structure that Maddie kind of just outlined, where the front leg comes up to the elbow and then they have that bone that comes forward to the point of their shoulder. And then that connects to the scapula, which runs back sort of as a triangle um, up across them there. So, oh, like yeah. This. So, this is actually the outline of your deer right here. Yes. So, yeah, yep. Literally, you've got it that sits forward and then punches back. Um, and you kind of got that is the, the shoulder in general. But, yeah, if you look at how far back the scap sits, what's that? There's like really one, two, uh, one, two, three, four, fifth rib back, and you're still covering it with the scap. Yeah, so um, that fifth and sixth rib. I do believe that is a fairly accurate um, diagram there, but yes, that scapula on different size animals will be slightly different. And mm-hmm. if you think about like the size of a fox, they sort of have a long, skinnier body compared to say a red deer or something like we're looking at here. Um, I do believe that scapula would be slightly bigger and come back slightly more. Okay, so yeah, and probably wouldn't sit up as high, right? Like wouldn't, yeah, wouldn't sit, sit down up, here. It would sit down a bit lower. Um, yeah, yeah. And the point of his elbow would kind of be back um, at that back of that shaded line mm-hmm. um, um, down the bottom there. But it's still a pretty good representation, and you can it kind of the bones at least definitely. So yeah. yeah, the structure of the bones and that kind of you can a lot of people like Brad Smith and all that. We always talk about the magic triangle. Mm-hmm. Um, which basically is a triangle where the long side is sort of basically runs up the back of the leg, sort of on the crease, yeah. straight up to the top of the spine there. And then the two points of the triangle angle forward, um, as you can see there. So really, oh, yeah, this, this would be a really triangle, but it's kind of... <laughs> I will be able to make it work. Essentially like that. And we'll <laughs> if you turn that around, small, yeah. Be kind of in like that. We'll... Turn yep. it again. More like that. There you go. Yep. Um, and then, it'll, yeah, it'll come back a bit, a little bit further. Um, but, yeah, that's essentially the magic triangle. Like a lot of people, when they're new, new to it and they don't know the structure of animals um, and stuff, they get worried about hitting them in that area mm-hmm. there because the shoulder, like, it looks dense, but it's all muscle. So that I was going to say, yeah, when you look at that side on as an animal, let's look at this little guy. Like, really, yeah. you're talking about You would assume here. that that's all bone. But yeah, you look at that and you're like, yeah, that's all bone, right? But really, you're trying to put your shot in in this sort of position. Like you're actually, if you see where the elbow is, that triangle yep. starts all the way in here, positions yep. out to there, comes down to that elbow. It's kind of like that, right? Yeah. That's the position. Yeah, yeah. So that's what um, most of us talk about as magic triangle. But I remember years ago when I was hunting with um, Brad Smith when we actually cut open um, a ball that I'd shot and he explained it more as like a teardrop shape because the lungs um, – sort of come up and back a lot further and then you don't want to go too far back off that crease because you'll be getting behind on the heart and sort of in the liver kidney sort of area just in front of the gut so a bit more kind of like that but not as big um yep so if you flip that around the other way oh you want it to be yep a 180 on that so the tip of the teardrop comes back yep that's it okay yeah it's more yeah it's kind of like a teardrop um which so the base of that teardrop will encompass that magic triangle area. Definitely. Lungs in the animals, they'll come up and back at yeah. an angle. So like if that. you were to hit an animal halfway down the body, you would want it to be in the top half of that animal to hit the lungs up high because below that... Um, to kind of like your seventh, anything within that seventh rib. 
you want yeah, to like pretty well. There. Yeah. Yeah. So that's pretty much the on broadside shot. That is the heart and lungs and the vital Golden where you want to be um, yeah. getting that shot into, which ultimately you always aim for that heart shot. There's a section where the lobes of the lung actually, because they sort of sit over each side of the heart and the heart's in the center. Mm-hmm. They're like kind of like umbrellas over the heart. And there's an area where the lobes of the lungs kind of sit down over um overlap the top of the heart where all the major arteries um in the aorta and all that come out of the top of the heart yeah. and it's what um myself and a few of us refer to as a heart lung shot which is the ultimate top of the heart you're gonna kill hitting them. the lungs yeah. as well and you're basically putting that animal down in the two most effective ways which is through um making your blood loss and yeah. also collapsing the lungs, um, causing lack of oxygen to the brain. And essentially, both those reasons, the animal will essentially like black out, pass out, go mm. to sleep, fight. Yeah. Um, so, so then essentially not suffering as much as, say, a rifle shot where it's blunt force trauma, you're hitting mm-hmm. spine or neck and you're putting them down. Like if that doesn't snap the brain stem or isn't a brain shot, they're not out instantly. They're essentially sort of paralyzed to begin with um but there's enough blunt force trauma of that um bullet causing sort of mass internal hemorrhaging um and causing yeah, wow. it to die as well so yeah and so in regards to the lungs like not looking at both lungs here but just that the one that's kind yes. of more so how your lung would sit right it doesn't sit as some people might think like a straight beam like that yeah it's not, they're more, more an angled like yeah. position um, and as you said, so say the blue was the heart, you've got one flap yep. kind of covering over that heart. Yep. Yes, essentially. So, yeah, you want to be top of the same, heart. Same, but different, um, yeah. Yeah, hitting those major arteries leading out of the heart. I um, mean, if you actually look, have a look at a heart, the bottom half of the heart is basically the bulk and the muscle that actually contracts in the beating mm-hmm. of that. So a low heart shot, you still will get a lot of blood and good blood trail and it will still kill that animal very, very effectively and quick. Um, might have to put in realistic. Oh, uh, no uh, way. <laughs> oh, um, oh, my God. I thought I just lost that whole document. I was like, no. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, so the heart has hollow chambers where the blood, the deoxygenated blood sort of goes in um, and then heads out to the lungs to mm. basically be reoxygenated and then it goes from the lungs back into the heart and then gets pumped out into the body um, with that fresh blood. So if you're in that top half of that blood, you're hitting those major arteries and opening them up. So you'll get major blood loss from that. If you're low heart through the meat, you will or nick the back of the heart. You will still put them down. It's still like a heart shot. It's a great shot, but it will take a little bit longer. They might go a little bit further because through more of the muscle. Yeah. Um, rather than taking off those the top of the heart there yeah bring forward there you go so kind of sim- sim- something like that yeah pretty Almost, well that's but yeah, yeah yeah that will do for yeah, demonstration much. purposes right really good idea yeah definitely yeah so scrolling back up then um we'll start back at the top like I said, we've got a lot of a lot of different critters to kind of work with. So if you have a look then, realistically, your lungs are kind of going to be just sitting over the crest here. Your heart's going to be pretty much in this sort of position. Right behind here. the bone. Right yep. behind the bone, right in here, essentially. So right that that right there yep. would be with the quartering on angle, that would be a heart, that would be in the top half of the heart. That's the top of the heart shot. Like that is you got a bone running directly across that. Mm-hmm. So most people you want to avoid those major bone structures so if i were to take a shot on that animal it would be up slightly and then back just above the bone like up about there ish yeah just behind the so you're missing that scapula you're above that front bone above the elbow and you basically your only option here is a double lung shot definitely um and when you're taking lung shots you do want to hit both lungs like quartering shots quartering on quartering away you got to make sure that you have the angle right so that you're not missing a lung because animals are tough even humans can actually live and function off one completely healthy functioning lung so if you only hit that animal in wow. one lung 
yes, that lung will collapse and not be working, but they will, will it's like I in the past have hit a bore, super tight coring away shot, didn't hit him far enough back to have the exit hit the offside lung. Mm-hmm. So I only got that onside lung sort of down the side of him. And three months later, we found that same bore again. He'd lost a lot of con- condition. Um, he went from being like a 100 kilo bore down to a 70 kilo bore. Wow. And I ended up getting the drop on him and we cut him open. And his shoulder and stuff was just a mass of scar tissue. And he'd healed and was no living, way. feeding completely fine. And yeah, so animals can 100% live off one lung. Um, the only issue they kind of run into with that is if, all that blood damage and the vessels that you do hit cause like a blood clot or something in the end up that essentially dying from a stroke or a heart attack or something like that, like that. which is very rare. So yeah, if you only hit one lung nine times out of 10, that animal probably will live. Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah, you'll be doing well to find them. Definitely. Um, so given that these ones in regards to this actual positioning, you have a look at where we've got, um, these few different nannies. This nanny's horn is pretty much right in a position where we'd actually want to be taking a shot on this guy. And then <laughs> this nanny's horn is actually kind of blocking the view as to where we would take a shot on that one. Yep. So, realistically, so, in this situation of these shots, this nanny here would actually be the best one. If you were going just for meat shot, that would probably be the, the shot you'd actually want to take on any of these animals, right? Yeah, I'd probably go the one that's slightly more quartering on. Like that 45 degree quartering mm-hmm. on is really bad shot for bone structure. So yeah, I wouldn't okay. recommend anyone taking that shot. You're yep. better off having them quartering more towards you so you can get in front of that point of the shoulder yep. and down through their body, essentially like through the front of their chest. Yeah, um, So, yeah, that would be, out of all those, that would be the shot that I would take on those. So you'd pretty um, much just be trying to get above that nanny's horn as much as you could. Yeah, yeah, pretty well just sort of. Yeah, through the neck, um, kind of shooting down on them because the head's down drinking and it would exit sort of so back behind low. the crease on the opposite side. You'd go lower on that? Is that what you're saying? No, nah, no, nah, that's pretty good height, if not slightly high, because it will exit lower. It'll enter higher on that animal's neck. And yep. when that animal stands up, it will enter, um, it will exit, sorry, down um, out back behind there. his elbow on the opposite yep. side there. Yep. Yeah, cool. Awesome. We're going to keep it moving. So this is a good shot in regards to a Billy. He's got his front leg forward. Um, great position in regards to like a broadside shot, essentially. Say he was yep. paused in that position rather than walking. Um, yeah. So um, just for people that aren't watching and are only listening, when the an animal has one leg forward, the other opposite leg will generally be back mm-hmm. and they will create a V um, between their legs. Yeah. So that V, you kind of want to go up straight from the point of that V in between the legs. Yep. And then if you're looking... For height-wise, you yep. want to be, well, as a rule of thumb, a third the way out. So if you split the width of that body um, or the height of that body into thirds, you want mm-hmm. to be at that lower third. Up. So, so in regards to his elbow, would you say that that's his elbow joint? Like that's essentially bone where I've got my marker? Uh, yeah, you can kind of see on his hairline there. Yep. It's down underneath the yep. cursor there. Yep. Yeah. Um, so you want to be just above that. Yep. Um, but yeah, so for the ease of it, for most people, you want to cut their body in half mm-hmm. and then go below, just a couple inches below that half. So um, realistically, anywhere from about here to here, you're looking at a pretty good shot. Yep. And that's like perfect line for that heart long, like we're talking there. Yep. Yep. Awesome. So we've got three. You got a, a nanny, a little young one, and then we've got the the old Billy in the back. And really, the young one is the kid is right in front of where you'd want to take your shot for the Billy. Yeah, yeah. I would not. Sh- yeah, I wouldn't take a shot there. Um, the only really shot is back of the lungs, but mm-hmm. that's a risky shot. Like you, yeah. I'd probably. I'd, I'd pass on that, wait for a, a clear shot. And so in regards to this nanny here, a shot on her, would you say that she is quartering away enough? Quartering on? Sorry, quartering on enough? Like that's a good angle or you want her to be transitioned a little bit more 
towards you. Yeah, the fact that her head's turned around and her body sort of goes back. Like, I know I've seen it a lot. Um, Americans, nothing against Americans or any Americans listening. Um, I have seen people shooting elk and they would have a shot angle like that mm-hmm. and they would choose to hit it behind the shoulder, back down yeah, the body. Yeah, I've seen that before. And go for a, a lung oh, shot. But you'd be hitting the back of the onside lung and you'd be going through gut and definitely definitely not a good shot when they are no. pulling on at that point you want to be in front of the, pretty much on the point of the shoulder or slightly in front of it yeah so um, like down through the chest so towards yeah. that side yep, of right the there. front shoulder yeah yep cool um we've got a new oh whoops let's see i think i just stuffed that let me grab this guy again got a new photo with plenty of goats this one's You've got this Billy up the top. Let's have a talk about him. Yep. So you've got Billy off to the side. He's kind of slightly quartering. Slightly him. quartering. Yep. Yeah. But you've got a full view of his shoulder. Yep. So even when they're slightly quartering on, I tend not to take those shots because you are getting back behind the heart. Yeah. Because that bone structure is completely covering the heart at that angle. Um, it's And it's not enough bigger. for you to get in front of the point of that shoulder to get down into his chest and heart that way. So so that would be a no shot. I Yeah, I wouldn't take that shot. The only shot you really have is sort of back of the lungs. Yeah. And then so this chick, she's actually same sort of position almost, right? Like you see where her front leg is, it's there. Yeah, so her front leg's in front, but her you can see that her body going off her back legs, mm-hmm. her body is more, it's pretty well side on and she's just yeah. got a head and front turn. So I'd just treat that as a perfect broadside shot. And I'd go straight up from that. Yep. Just made it bigger rather than getting hard to drag it around. So that shot there, you pretty much want to run up straight up from the middle of that front leg. Mm -hmm. And once again, about that third the way up the body. So pull it in a little bit tighter, what you think, even. Yeah, I'd probably go down slightly. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, you want to be below that halfway, um, just in case. Like, you kind of aim for deer. I'd probably say aim even like a quarter if you halve that body and then halve the bottom half again. Mm-hmm. I find the height you want because that kind of accounts for that animal dropping at any point, or if you're out slightly and your arrow hits a couple inches higher than you expected, you're collecting those lungs. Definitely, yeah. All right, this is one with lots of goats. <laughs> let's zoom in more for these ones <clears throat> so in regards to shots you would say that's a non-shot but that would almost be a shooter yeah so yeah because his legs forward he, yeah. he's moving that scapula and he, that bone structure forward and opening up that triangle essentially where um behind his his pocket there so that cursor right where you've got it would be my shot that's where i'd put my mark that's where his heart would be sitting um in that situation with lots of goats i wouldn't take a shot because i know that i would get a pass through and my arrow would probably clean Definitely up get who knows one. how many goats behind it 100 <laughs> percent. yeah here we go got some goats front on and some really in this position if you had a shot on any of these guys, which one would you be taking? If say no, no matter about the actual horns as such, but if you were going for a shot yep. just based on ethics, which would be your most ideal one? Personally, I would. It would kind of be 50, 50 between that completely front on one and that black one in the front there. Yeah, and that one that's broadside. The broadside yep. shot, you have more room to play with. Um, mm-hmm. I guess you have a bigger area that of vitals because you're side on to those lungs. Yeah. You have a bigger area where you can make an ethical shot. Um, whereas front on, I believe front on shots are so brutal, very yeah. effective. Yeah. But you have less room to play in the left, right situation as well mm-hmm. as height. Mm-hmm. Um, so you've got to be, I'd not, I only take, um, front on shots close like definitely for me 15 and under like a 20 meter front on shot is getting out there for a front on shot because that animal if they're front on nine times out of ten they're looking at you they're alert yeah. and they will move pretty That's quick right. yeah 
say we're taking a shot at that one front on essentially it's pretty much where that shadow point hits right you've got the shadow point yep off the um yep but just going off his back legs he's slightly so turned like he's not in. dead far on, so you'd be slightly to the left of center yeah so about yep. there ish yep yep that'd be perfect right there get another little x happening and then oh, what have i done here let's steal this x back i'm going to put him in and around here for you yep that's pretty well it could be back, back slightly bit, the yeah. tiniest bit but yeah where that is now or we'll backing in from that that is like top of the heart that and we'll, we'll be down in a matter of seconds and we'll not go far at all Big Billy Goat Gruff looking at us. This he's kind of he's an interesting one because you can't we actually don't have view of his legs, but I'd say one yeah. leg's here, one leg's here. Essentially he's pretty yeah. much covering his whole vitals in a sense. Yeah. Yeah, pretty well. He's kind of at that angle where if you go through sort of the front of his chest, you probably yeah. miss him across the front of the heart. Uh -huh. um, and then if you go through his leg, body is turned way. enough. You could go just behind that scapula, just in back here slightly, but down a little bit. Yeah, so I'd go back. That would still collect his scapula there, I believe. So about there. Yeah. Okay. Um, and about halfway up the body. If you're aiming for a long shot, you kind of want to be halfway up. So you actually move it up if a little bit high here, more like there ish. Yeah. Yeah. You'd hopefully just um. Put that arrow, slip that arrow in behind the scapula, and then the angle of the exit for that would still collect um, the middle or back half of that offside lung. Mm. Moving on to the foxes. This is one of the animals I'm most excited to try hunt this year. Fox. Do you get many foxes up your way? Dude, I actually saw the very first fox, my very first fox ever on the block that I've been going to for almost five years now. I saw one the other, like not the other not day. That way. Yeah, so I haven't targeted him yet, but um, I will definitely try to go back for him because he actually showed up on a camera. We put a pig trap up and he showed up on the camera in yeah, that. Cool. So I'm intrigued to go back and get him, but um, I'm, yeah, planning on coming down south. So hopefully I can target one down there as well. That would be <laughs> sick. For someone like this. Yeah. You've actually got so he's walking right now. It's a moving shot. Um, in regards to something like a smaller animal, at what point do you almost disregard the bone structure? Like, is there a point for you where you're like, okay, it's a rabbit, yeah. it's fine? Yeah, apart from the skull. So, if yeah. fo you whistle a fox in or call a fox in, they're coming in front on, I would not recommend with a bow and a broad head shooting them between the eyes. Mm -hmm. Um, because the tip of that broadhead would generally hit the bridge of that because it's not a flat, they're not impacting a flat surface. It'll hit and run along that bone and, and kind of like deflect, yeah. I guess. Um, I've seen it in the past. Of Yeah, I wouldn't recommend going for a headshot on any animal with a bow and arrow. Yeah. Um, because, yeah, normally if that's the case, you'll hit center of the bridge of the nose and that broadhead will reflect and then go through the eye socket and won't be center of the body and like you probably still will get them and kill them but it's, yeah, it's a seen, risky one right it's a very risky one i've seen in the past headshots on a fox and that fox runs off and oh my god finds a hole that's, somewhere and <laughs> that's <a laughs> yeah, nightmare. i wouldn't recommend that but as for the body and their bones and stuff if you're shooting a bow that's upward of 60 pound even 50 pound um i believe would probably be enough that you could take a quartering on shot um like we got here with this fox you would aim right for where you know that heart sits yeah and i would not worry about penetration they're a soft very soft skinned animal mm -hmm. um and the bone that you do hit most um solid broadheads like if you use like an expandable or something you may run into an issue but then again they've got such a big cut um cutting blade on them that yeah you'll be doing a lot of damage yeah definitely. um yeah so that one there for quartering on slightly quarter on shots like that you kind of want to aim for the offside elbow so i'd probably move that back the tiniest bit yeah and down a smidge yeah like not too long there. foxes because foxes are such a small animal like you can pretty well yeah Yep, oh, that's where I put it. Just below half, 
Yeah. Um, so then you don't risk hitting too low or you're just going to the bottom of it. Um, and Fox, especially when you're calling them in, a lot of times you'll get, the shot you will get is really close. Mm-hmm. And most people that are shooting 70, 80 pound, their top pin's normally like a 20 meter pin. Yeah. Um, and when you get to that close of a distance, the arrow doesn't have enough time to reach the arc or that arrow flight height of your sight fairly well. So mm-hmm. if you're five meters and under, you kind of got to take into account that that arrow is coming out of the bow below your sight and you will yeah. hit below where your pin is sitting. Mm-hmm. There you go. Front on shot. Nice looking flights. It is beautiful, right? This is yeah, a front-on so, shot, one sitting down. Yep, right between his front legs. Pretty much. Oh, yeah, yeah I'll put it right up. there. Yeah. I'll put it right there because he's sitting. Sitting, um, yeah, it's going to curve um, it all around. Yeah, that's going to be coming out, sort of out through his lungs, through the top of his back because of the angle of his back. Mm-hmm. Um, You wouldn't want to go too high because then you'd risk sort of just going through the neck, yes. which you probably would still collect the jugular and stuff, but yeah. Where you've got that extra right there, um, in between his legs, that would be a perfect hard shot. Little guy running on in. Not actually, he's kind of he's paused, but similar yep. sort of shot, right? He's pretty much you front. Caught him in his... <laughs> you what pulled him that? up it. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Oh, you caught him in, you pulled him up, he's looking for where the where the feed is. Given that he is actually standing in this position, you'd go slightly higher than what we've done on the yeah. other one, right? Like, yeah, I would go slightly higher. Even higher, yeah. You're probably going to be shooting slightly down on him as well. Uh-huh. Oh, yeah, true. You're standing in front of a tree um, whistling. So, yeah, you just want to make sure you get it under that chin um, for most of those front-on shots if you're slightly shooting down on him. Mm-hmm. So, yeah, we've got that there. It was it was pretty good. Yeah. I think this is one of the last of our foxes. Not yep. a lie. Oh, got another one. We've got another. So given that he's coming in, he's coring on, so you want to get in front of this shoulder. And if you're aiming for the back of his elbow, if you want to aim for that, is that what you're saying essentially? Whenever you're shooting? Yep. So the more that they turn front on, the further it will be back. Okay. Um, so, yeah, since he's turned more forward and you've got that real, you got a fair gap between his front legs, Mm-hmm. You want to sort of aim for the front point of his shoulder um, yep. on the on side. There. Yeah. A bit more. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. Right there, just to the left of um of his cheek there. So that will come through and that will exit probably halfway down his body on his offside, halfway back down through the yeah, bridge. That'll collect the heart end. Yeah. And the lung um, as that's exiting there. Here we go. Last fox, then we've got some cats. Have you shot many cats? I've shot a few. Um, I haven't shot one in a lot of years. Um, but yeah, when I was younger, growing up, um, out west there and stuff, yeah, I've shot my fair share of cats. Um, we've actually got a few on our place at the moment that show up on cameras like once every in, once in a blue moon. Um, there's a tabby one and a black one, and they've been <laughs> living there for quite a while. And I'm assuming <laughs> they they will be breeding up. So I'll be surprised if I can't get a drop on that. On a feral cat here it's soon. Pretty interesting you hear about how many there are in the wild. Like I think there's more native, more wild cats than there are foxes. Yeah, but yeah, yep. you don't see them anywhere near as much. I mean, obviously, play, in place dependent. I've definitely got cats on my block. Never seen them. I've heard them of the night time. They come into the into yep. the house block and they try to get the the farm cats going. But I've never never actually seen one out in the wild. Yeah, and they're they're hard to call in. Like foxes, you can call them in, and they're kind of a run their prey down type of animal. Like they'll mm-hmm. They hear like you're whistling, or they hear like a rabbit or a bird or something that's injured. They're running in and grabbing that thing before any other fox in that area can grab it. And they, whereas cats, uh, will like leopards, tigers, they stalk their prey, um, and they sort of slink through the grass, they sort of sneak around and will pounce on it when they're close. So, mm-hmm. yeah, it's really hard to see them. Um, I have in the past called like whistled in cats, yep. Uh, they'll pop their head up and you won't see them coming and be like, oh, you're right there. Like, <laughs> they'll just sneak in on you um, when you're not expecting it. Yeah, wow. Well, I've heard that um, the whistles will only work in particular if there's like a lot of ra- uh, rabbits around as well. Like you, you turn yeah, the field so, ones. Yeah, so your different calls will vary. So we don't really have many rabbits on our place, but we have a lot of hares mm. um, and their calls are a lot different. So yeah, we use it like a hare caller. 
um, which is more like a squawking yeah. type of sound. Could um, play off as like an injured cock too or something like that as well. So that's yeah, sort okay. of cool. that's most effective for our area. Yeah. So this guy, he's got, he's pretty much broadside, but he's got his his front foot back. So he's blocking his yeah. vitals once again. Um, he'd once again almost go for that elbow on the opposite side. Yeah, I would use that V between his legs, go straight yeah. up from that. Yeah, um, okay. And then, yeah, it, right there or, yeah, anywhere from there to an inch or two um, further oh, back. Oh, you, yeah. Yeah, you're collecting those lungs. Yeah, I don't want to, yeah, keep it just like that half, um, halfway of the body there. Yeah. Cat, she's actually not giving us a shot at all. No, nah, that's, yeah, head's completely covering the chest. Yeah. This is like a typical broadside perch cat that's almost, um in that position, I'd almost say like, that's a very typical position you'd see a cat in, right? Almost if it's aware, yeah. ready to take yep. off. But once again, you're almost saying with this style animal, this smaller animal, you're good just to be able to take a shot, right? Being poundage dependent, but yeah. Yeah. Yep. So you can go there. He has got his elbow tucked a little, like back a fair way down in body, as you can oh, see. No. So his heart will still be sitting forward in his chest. So yeah, where like you had it there was, yeah, pretty well right. Like you can kind of see the dip in his back mm-hmm. um, where his scapula would be sort of coming up as he's hunched up on his spine like that. So you sort of go from, yeah, that dip in his back there, which is pretty much the perfect line that you've got. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Interesting. This one's a hard quartering away shot. Like almost to the extent that you yeah, pretty much don't have a shot, right? Yeah. Unless you unless you the only shot you really have there would be like a Texas heart shot. I was gonna say, yeah, taking the whole thing. Not recommend taking. <laughs> no. <Yeah. laughs> this one's a bit of a better one in regards to quartering away. Yep. Um, but given that the front foot is so far forward, you've almost got so you, you think about with a regular quartering away shot, you want to go back, but given that the front foot's so far forward, you can see like the heart and everything's gonna be in this sort of position, right? Yeah. So I'd come up from the back of that onside leg. Yeah. As line. You can kind of see his crease there. Yep. Yeah, in through there somewhere. Yeah, because his chest is turned around. So you'd you have a little bit of room to play because angling away, you've got a lot of vitals to collect and a lot of mm-hmm. organs and stuff that you're going through um, on a quartering shot. So, yeah, where you have it there is probably the furthest forward I would go. And then yeah, you have okay. to come back. back um, more. Yeah, yeah, I would put that. That's where I would probably put my pin. Yeah. Uh, we got a red stag, a ridiculous red stag, and he's laying down. <laughs> Would you take a shot on a laying stag in this sort of situation? No, no. Red stags, they have their bone. If you hit bone, it's even not with going anywhere. Yeah, even like with an eighty plus pound setup, five hundred and thirty to six hundred grain arrow. If you hit major bone, you will get pedo, but not enough to get through to that other side. So yeah. That one, yeah, I probably just wouldn't. Wait you probably could it. slip it where you put, like in front, and yeah, hope for the best. Go for a quartering on through. I the mean, because he's actually tucked down the way, you'd actually want to go a little bit lower, even I reckon. Yeah, you'd want to go low. Yeah, yeah. but yeah, you do run a very high that's risk a, of breaking that leg bone. Very hard shot if you're going to do it. Um, here we go. Red stag, pretty much standing. He's slightly quartering on. Um, but once again, you'd go slightly in front of the shoulder but pin it to that front side shoulder a bit more, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah just because he's yeah. angled there. Yeah, even potentially <laughs> a little bit lower where you've got your, your yeah, headlines. Yeah, you can kind of see yeah. that colour line. So where, he's, yeah. where the mane of his neck comes down to a V, which is a couple inches above where you've got that there, Yeah, that's kind of your the limit for your high. Your, if you go any further above that, you're... Kind of just through the neck, like you might be lucky to collect major arteries and jugular and stuff, but mm-hmm. thinking of where that arrow is going through and going to be exiting and what vitals it's collecting on the way, the height that you've got that there is pretty well perfect. Yeah. Roaring star, stag, pretty much quartering on. Um, yeah. I mean, once again, that's a, a pretty darn <laughs> tough shot to take. Yeah, so you can kind of even see there, like where you've got that cursor right there is where you would want to hit, but that would be the front point of his shoulder, and that would be yeah, a yeah, dense bone true. joint. So you wouldn't wouldn't risk it on that one. No, this is a good one. 
little hind, red hind. She's slightly, slightly quartering away, but pretty much broadside. You can, and this is really cool. Like in an animal like this, you they pretty much show you the V, right? With yeah. like the, the armpit sort of hole and everything you've got there. You've got your muscle structure in this position. It's a, it's a pretty blurry photo, but it does give a lot of like, you can pretty much <coughs> say like in this point in here, yeah, so that'd be the front of the triangle. So you, that's, that's a pretty given, good shot. Um, given that she's slightly angled, though, you'd want to go back a bit, right? Yeah, so I'd go straight up from that offside leg as my line. Okay, um, so even further back. Yeah, probably right there. Yeah, yep. because he's slightly angled. This is a very good angle for people that are new mm -hmm. um, to bow hunting because it opens up so much that onside a lot, and that's probably the biggest kill zone you would have um, on an angle. Definitely. You got a big old red stag and he's sitting. Oh, that's a slightly interesting shot, isn't it? Because he is, he's broadside with his legs stacked, but then he's got his tail tucked back on around him a little bit. Yeah. So I just look at the front half of his body there. The fact that his two legs are silhouetted behind each other. It would pretty much put his chest cavity completely broadside to you. So for yeah, that okay. shot, I would, yep, exactly that line. So the, the back half mm -hmm. of his front leg, go straight up from that, which is the exact line you've got. And then yep. I'd drop it down yeah. slightly. About yeah, there, so you're going to want a third or just below a third. Um, so just you go even lower than that? Because I kind you of think that's an elbow joint. Like, it's Yeah, his elbow would be down Slightly no, down. It's actually so you, probably more like there, isn't it? The elbow joint. Yeah. 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 So with that height you've got there is perfect. Top of the heart. Like if you hit him there, he's going nowhere. Gone. Yeah. Um, give you a bit of room to play for height as well. So slightly uh he's pretty much broadside, but he's got one leg, he's walking, which makes it hard for the shot position. Um but he's actually pretty much he's framing that whole front leg is almost framing his whole vital system. If you look at that, you could still yeah, get so that dark long shot him. That you're second there. Yep, that would be yep. his triangle. So that shot, he is slightly quartering on. Um, the yep. way his body turned, I would go I'll use back the a little bit. front, the front of his onside leg there. Go to the front side of that leg and straight up. Um, More like up in here somewhere. Yeah, sort of the front of the front half of that triangle um, is where you'd want to try and get that arrow in there. Kind of in there a bit yeah. more. Maybe a little lower. Yeah, a bit lower. Um, below that half and then... Yeah. yeah. And then you got a bit of room to play. Like, if you hit an inch further forward, you'd probably still um, be behind that bone. Yeah. And, yeah. Yeah, it's pretty fascinating, isn't it? Like, just how much of that slight angle can make such a difference. Yeah. And a lot of times, it's really hard. You've got to, like, kind of make sure on the angle and get a good idea of how that animal has its body situated um, when you are going to make a shot and pick your point. Mm -hmm. What are you reckon about that? Go. Yep. That, that would, yeah. That's pretty well top of the heart. Like using, mm -hmm. you can see that V between his front legs yeah. Um, pretty much straight up from that V sort of it's Essentially, in the crease in that pocket, he's opening that up. Yeah. Um, and low poundage, low air poundage bow, that's a really good shot because you're getting pano very easily, especially on like boards and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. You're in that crease, there's kind of forward of that crease, like over the triangle and up over the lungs, their fighting pad gets pretty thick and dense. So, if you can Definitely. slip it in their pocket at a slightly quartering away, you're not really hitting any major fighting pad or anything. So, you'll find a lot easier to get good penetration. 100. So you got a broadside stag, but he's walking, so he's marching. He's got his front foot forward. Now, this is actually an interesting yep. question that I had. Uh, you'd actually sent me a, a video of a pig, and you'd shot it on the move. Um, and obviously, it's something yeah. you're, you're pretty aware of. And um, <clears throat> you had told me you were pretty much aiming a front, a foot in front of him and you end up hitting pretty much in like the direct <laughs> pocket where you're meant to, like it was an incredible shot for the place. Yeah. So he was, he was half on the trot. He was getting out of there. I just, yeah, just kind of knew you're definitely following the speed him, of the bow. Yeah. yeah. You, had, you have to put a bit more lead on than what you would expect. Um, and yeah, if anyone's ever shot rifles, 
a lot, even at like a close range, you don't have to put much because the speed of a bullet is so like good. exponential compared to an arrow. Definitely. But even on like a moving or a running, like a running shot with a rifle at a little bit of a distance, you got to like put a, a foot or two like lead on them most times um, to hit mm-hmm. him in the shoulder. So, yeah, I, I wouldn't recommend um, taking moving shots on animals. Definitely not. No. I mean, but, I was going to say, you, you're pretty darn experienced, right? You've been bow hunting your whole life. <laughs> I think you told me you've done uh, as a number, like well over, did you say over 700 animals you reckon you've taken? Probably. Yeah, they'd be getting up there. Um, yeah. yeah, it's a lot. It's probably, yeah, probably even more than that um, now. And that's, yeah, just all with the bow. So, with the bow, yeah. So, I mean, you've definitely got, got a lot of years on a lot of us. <laughs> yeah. And even then, I still find myself in situations where I will you know, tell myself, no, nah, I have no shot and I know mm-hmm. my capabilities and, and i think that's such the, a that's something that, that i use so so i was gonna say that's something that everyone needs to be able to figure out for themselves right like you need to you need to know your limitations you need yeah, to have yeah, your comfortable boundaries that you're going to stick within when you're when you're bow hunting yeah yeah so where you've got that there is pretty well perfect you can kind of because you've got his leg tucked forward you mm-hmm. can see that elbow the back of his elbow there yeah. kind of highlighted a bit yep so that's pretty much the back of his elbow um, so you kind of want to just hit the offside leg, I guess, essentially. Yeah. Use that for your line. So um, and then, yeah, about that forward. third. Yeah, so anyway, from where you had it, sort of from the back of that leg even, mm-hmm. just above his elbow, from yeah. there through to where you have it in that whole triangle area on that broad side. Yeah. You want to be in that zone there. Your front on stag. Well aware of you. He's uh, 50, 14 <laughs> metres just to be within your shot. <laughs> yeah <laughs> but we've got some we've got some brush and he's actually so if you look at where his body position is he's not completely front on he's kind of tucking off to the back he's almost quartering on in a sense yeah so you don't yep. want to bring it right over into this side yeah you want to be slightly because you kind of want to envision that it's kind of hard um with oh, animals because yeah. they're a 3d object that is not transparent so you kind of want to imagine that there's a heart or an orange or tennis ball or mm-hmm. whatever you want to imagine um, sits central to their the width of their body, yeah, and it sits pretty well in between their front legs down the bottom of their chest, yeah. Um, so no matter the angle that you turn this animal at, you should essentially have a fair idea of being able to envision where that heart's where sitting yep. within that animal. Um, for people starting out, I would definitely recommend analyzing the animal, and if it's like a spotted pig or a colored goat, using a tuft of hair or a mm-hmm. spot or a mark yeah. um, as your reference to aim for once you've got that angle um, identified just for ease of knowing where to aim. Um, but I'm to the point where now where I don't really pay attention to those sorts of things when I'm aiming because I've got such a good idea and I've, I've um, dissected and butchered up enough animals that I've shot in the past and analysed my own shots that I've taken, knowing where that heart sits and where those vitals are. I can just sort of take that animal's body as a whole and envision where that heart's sitting and then make a call on what bone structure's in the way from there as to whether I'd take that shot. Yeah. Yeah, I think just knowing the anatomy is so important, right? Yeah, yeah. And, yeah, especially people that are new getting into it. If if you shoot an animal and you make a good shot um, in the process of when you're taking meat for that animal or if it's like a ranked old pig or a fox or something like that, even just taking the time to get an idea of that bone structure. Um, mm-hmm. Brad Smith's really good for doing this. I know they go through shot placement up there at Coyuga Adventures um, yeah. extensively and they take time to, um, when an animal's been taken, show that and use it as a learning opportunity. Yeah. Um, and in years past, like me growing up, going through it, like every now and again, like even just as a refresh, I'd, make a shot on an animal and that animal would go down in like 10 metres type of thing. And I'd be like, yep, yeah, I'll whip his shoulder off, open up that rib cage, see where my arrow went, exactly what it hit, mm-hmm. knowing the angle and where those vitals are sitting, um, just to really have a good understanding of, of all that. Definitely. Yeah, I think it's, it's definitely a valuable lesson, right? Like if, if they're making sure what they're doing every single time up at Kyogre Adventures, it's for a big reason. It's definitely going to yeah. work. Yeah. I mean, this um, this front on shot in regards to where he is, you actually can't see his legs. You can't kind of see where the V kind of ends within his hair, but you can actually see, like, it's almost like down here, right? Like his, yeah. his V point. So his chest, like the bottom of his chest, is probably going to almost be down underneath the picture here. 
Actually, you can see, you can yeah, see it how low it is. Down it'd be down, down in there almost. Yeah. Yeah. So, so really, um, if that was a clear shot and there wasn't like a bit of brush or something in front of him, yeah. it would be down below the V of that main. Um, and then with him slightly quartering, it would be slightly just off slightly center. So it angles slightly. through. Yeah. So almost down yeah. Here, so right? that'd be your line, and then you'd probably want to yeah probably go down on your you know, type thing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think this is one of our last stags that we've got, and we've got a few other animals we're going to. We get into the piggies <laughs> next. So he's pretty much straight broadside, right? Like, yeah, little bit of a. But once again, so I liked what you said before we even started. Like, if you go, if you think about your front leg. You pin yep. it completely in half and go all the way up and then just above your elbow joint, and that's going to be a pretty decent like yeah. position. So you use that for your um for your lion and then make sure you're below that half. Below so that about half. Yeah. Of the body. Yeah. yeah. That's in the middle of the triangle. Um a lot of people would just put that on the crease. So if you go back mm -hmm. an inch or two on that animal's body, right yeah, that would still be an excellent kill shot. Like that's back of the heart and lungs. Um mm -hmm. if you go too far behind that crease into the sort of that lighter section and shade yeah um even there you probably still hit the bottom of the lungs below that you'd sort of be behind the heart and then you move into gut and stuff so exactly. that's probably the limit for the height and back any further back or below that um yeah you wouldn't want to go there but yeah essentially from that entire triangle from the front point of his shoulder yeah so anywhere from where you've got that, yeah, between those two, yeah. I would say that back one is sort of on your back Complete limit. Cast, you want to yeah. sort of be in front of that on that crease um, or slightly forward where you've got that other other point there. Definitely. Then we want some pigs. And this one's quartering on. And the yeah, hard thing so, with pigs yeah. and quartering on shots in particular, frontal shots in general, is that they've got no neck, right? Like it's <laughs> pretty, pretty much, much head body. <laughs> yeah. makes it tough. So this the angle that he's at here, this shot, I've actually taken this shot on a hell of a lot of good balls in the past. Um yeah. as long as you're clearing that cheekbone or that chin, um yeah, a lot of man. times I've taken this shot, I've been crouched down in long grass and the ball's picked up a bit of movement and if, especially if they're running, they'll mm -hmm. see that. And if you're low to the ground, they'll come over and kind of suss you out and see what you are. So they'll be coming towards you and they'll normally have their head down and then they'll lift it up, try and get a bit of look and they'll be dropping yeah. their head sort of up and down. And if you can get under that chin when their head is up, yep. down sort of the side of their cheek there, right where you've got that, that's basically the reverse of the perfect quartering away shot. So yeah. that'll exit few ribs back behind the crease on the other side that's the yeah, taking out the top of the heart and lungs yeah i mean obviously if you're if you're standing so you think about pig if you're standing on this shot you're actually going to need to come up higher for your shot because if you're standing and you're well above yeah, it you're you're to shoot down, down, down and out yeah yeah if you're shooting slightly down on him you want to yeah kind of oh, go yeah. half yeah you kind of need to be able to envision where the exit of that will be and Definitely. you don't want it to be too low no What's this? He's almost got like his um. It almost looks like a computer speaker out in the the wild on a game <laughs> camera. <laughs> That's hilarious. It's interesting. Uh, so another pig. He's um quartering away. He's got his back leg. No, sorry, his front leg is back. So he's kind of covering his vitals with that. But if you were to go off with your rule once again, you'd almost punch it in here, right? Yeah. So that would be as forward as you'd want to go. And then because of the angle that he is he at, you come back. back. Yeah. So you use the back of that um front leg mm -hmm. is your reference yeah and that's like perfect that's pretty good height there with clearing away shots i found over the years you're better off being slightly further back than too far forward because if they're quartering mm -hmm. away and you're too far forward you you'll collect everything. the onside lung but you'll, yeah. it will exit sort of forward in front of that offside lung so you better if you're slightly further back on a quartering away shot it will be better um because you'll collect a lot more vitals and organs through their body. Yeah, okay. All right. We'll go with this one at the back. Oh, what would I just do? Not what I wanted to, that's for sure. <laughs> <laughs> this one here with these mud um, being on him, a pretty good reference for, like, height. You want to kind yeah. of be on that mud line. Uh-huh. Um, if you imagine them, there's a little bit for each crease there where... 
there's no mud, but yeah. So that's pretty well. He's practically broadside, maybe slightly yeah. quarter and on, but his front legs are split, so he's creating that V. So you want to use the, the top of that V, v. if you're lying. So yep. Yeah. Yep. And yeah, that's pretty good for height, just below that sort of halfway point. He's pretty small pigs, so. Yeah. I actually want to move this photo along. Because that would be a good one to take a shot on as well, right? Yeah, yeah, perfectly broadside. You can see, um, being a bit thin and hair, you can really see that crease. Uh huh. Um. Yeah. So yeah, you kind of want to be yeah. It's also right his front foot, front foot slightly forward again, so you can almost go like that V, almost. Yeah. In. Yeah. Would that slightly be too far forward. in? You reckon? That's not too far forward like the front that still would be hard and a lot of vitals yeah um, but i'll probably go any further forward forward no definitely so from so there back still... to about oh. yeah back to about there about so there. kind of yeah my pair that's that's a really good shot there i'd probably move forward like the tiniest that's little bit good. and that would yep. be my ultimate perfect yeah that's that's top of the heart yeah um guaranteed for that one there that's incredible once again, if you're just listening, um, you can definitely jump across the YouTube channel because it's going to be up there. So it would make this a lot, lot better viewing. <laughs> it's good fun for us, that's for sure. Um, <laughs> hopefully we're explaining enough if you are just listening and can kind of get your grasp around it. So we've got a mob of pigs. We've got one who's pretty much, he's kind of front, he's quartering, uh, sorry, quartering on. Then we've got one that's broadside to us and one that's hidden, like the other two are hidden behind those ones pretty much. So yeah. say that this is your big ball that you're going for. And like you said, he's almost looking up at you. If you can clear that chin, which I don't think you've actually got a shot on here. Yeah, can... so I would be, yep. So if you go slightly lower and then to the left, a whisker. Yep. In like there. Right there. Yep, that would be my shot on that yep. pig. If you can slip it down yep. under there. Um, yep. You can, but this shot is risky. And once again, like super, I'm talking close range, like 10 meters oh, and yeah, under. Definitely, that definitely. arrow will get there quicker than they can make Maneuver. any substantial movements. Um, so you'll be getting that in there pretty quick. So that would be the only kill shot on that for that angle um, with a bow. But I'm yeah, actually so surprised with how quick a pig will move, especially like if they're aware. Oh, yeah. they, they, they duck that string so quickly. Yeah. And a lot of people don't realize that a lot of their movement, because they don't, they don't have really long legs to be able to drop on or spring on. Yeah. Um, so pigs, a lot of their movement will be more of like a turning or rolling sort of situation. Uh-huh. Yeah. Drop and roll. So, yeah, that broadside pig right there, you can kind of see like a bit of a V Cruise. created by his legs there. Yeah. And you yeah. can see his crease. I would normally recommend being just in front of the crease. Okay, so back um, just a slight smidge. Yep. Yeah. So right there, yeah, on the crease is still a good shot mm -hmm. um, for broadside, but you just risk getting close to being too far back and, and missing um, those important parts. So I'm going to hurry us along. Unfortunately, we've got about eight minutes left. <laughs> so I think we're at 30 of, 30 of, what have we got? 50. Shit. <laughs> well, I'm running out of time here. Let's jump straight to, so we've done a fair few pigs. This is a good one. Yeah. That's quartering on enough that uh -huh. you can get that in front of the point of that sh shoulder and you pretty much don't have anything there. Like that's going through the neck and yep. that's fairly well open to the chest cavity from that angle. Um, oh, a bit yeah. Bit yeah. So I go slightly up because his neck's down. I yep. go slightly up um, and then back to the left, a whisker. But that's, yeah, you want to angle through, pretty much come out. Yeah. yeah. So that would yeah. essentially come out, yeah, just on the crease or behind it on that offside there. Yeah. All right. I'm going to scroll through a few pigs here. Yep. Here we go. We're going to see some chittle. That's so, a pretty good one. There. You can kind of see where his elbow is. If you use that bottom line, there. those white dots. Yep. So that's pretty well his elbow. You want to be, because he's kind of turned slightly, you kind mm -hmm. of want to use that elbow as your line. Yep. Um, and then you want to be just above that elbow. And Chittle being a very switched oh, on, high reflex type of deer, you want to be a quarter. I would recommend aiming a quarter. A yeah, you just want to clear that elbow for where you're aiming. So yeah. that then if that animal reacts, you have uh, a good foot, foot and a half, and then to drop, and you'll still collect the lungs. Um, but if he does not move, 
you're above that elbow in in the heart. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Would you take it? Oh, I personally wouldn't. Nah, he's no, pretty I big. Wouldn't. I wouldn't. I wouldn't risk a shot like that. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> if you had to, last. If you had to. I mean, I believe that Even myself, lower, right? my bow, yep. I would get the penetration if I hit the front point of that shoulder. And I've taken this shot on, on Fallow where I have literally just aimed for the dense bone of the point of that shoulder, mm. cracked them right on it, and I've got, still got a pass-through and an exit yeah, well. wound. Um, but, yeah, that heart is sitting where that, like, given that he's where that cross is right there. It's kind of, yeah, it's so slightly to the right. Yeah. But it's guaranteed bone on that shot. So, mm -hmm. Yeah, I I definitely wouldn't take that shot. Sitting deer. No shot there. Not really, right? Not really. Like he's quartering a bit and you could get it down his neck, but when animals are laying down, mm. um, even pigs when they're bedded as well, if they're sort of in a prone position, so not um I'm not saying like laying on their side and stuff like that. If they're in a prone position or sitting laying upright like that. You've got to get pretty well to that ground line. Like that ground yeah, line definitely. is basically it sort yeah, of pushes up all their all their vitals and the bottom of their chest is sitting on that dirt. So mm -hmm. when you're talking about your height of a third the way up, it's pretty low. Yeah, it's literally gonna be right in in there. Right. Like, yeah. That's crazy. It's, it's essentially, yeah. It's pretty low. A prominent Adam's apple on this one and a <laughs> Brush like pe <laughs> penile sheath. <laughs> this is a fellow, a fellow buck. Yeah, he's slightly cording away, but pretty much completely broadside. Yeah, so that really exactly. exposes that pocket and that soft spot um in behind their elbow there. So yeah, yeah, right yeah. where you've got that, and then you've probably got a inch yeah, a behind that to play with. Um, yeah. but yeah, you want to stay below. You can kind of see that line. What would be the highest shot you reckon would be all right on this guy? Yeah, halfway up, but that's assuming that he won't move at all. Definitely, um, yeah. Yeah, so you want to be below that bit of a line that you can see in the colour. I was going to say, he's pretty much got and, a perfect little line for you to be yeah, able to Yeah, so you okay. want to be below that, sort of in that real light part of the pocket. Yeah. Um, I'll go slightly down, and yeah, essentially yeah. in that real highlighted spot right there. Yep. Yeah. That would be a perfect heart shot for that, that animal at that angle. It's beautiful. Shit or stag, but unfortunately, yeah. wise, that's really you're gonna have to wait for him. Yeah, to take that's, a step or two. Yeah, he's turned enough that majority of his bone structure there is covering all his vitals. So mm -hmm. that's just a cartoon. We won't use that one. This is an interesting shot. Would you take it, or you'd like wait for it? Yeah, with deer, um, unless you've like a red stag or a fellow buck when you're pulling. I mean, and they're kind of preoccupied or they're on the move coming in towards you and you pull them up. They're kind of mm -hmm. not really waiting. But when a deer is just feeding and they stand up, head raised in a quartering on position, I wouldn't recommend, like I personally probably wouldn't take that shot. And especially for that angle, there's a lot of bone structure in the way there. Yeah. Um, so I think that's, a, that's a fair sign to say, like, in general, don't take that shot then. Like, if you wouldn't take it, then I think yeah. no one should really be taking it, right? Like, yeah, if, I've, I've literally seen sure, your um, bow like slip through ridiculous size pigs like butter <laughs> like melted butter just thoop, like straight through so if you're not willing to take a shot like that like i don't think anyone should be yeah and that's the thing like with all these shot like placements that we are putting on these like if you're not sure mm -hmm. i know not getting a shot away and you kind of in times like situational like that if you don't take a somewhat possible risky shot and that animal wins you see you gets away runs off or whatever and you don't have that shot trust me and like a lot of other bow hunters will tell you they would rather have not taken a 100%. risky shot and that animal get away and live and you have the potential to get find him later down the track and get a yeah. good shot on him rather than wounding that animal and hitting them bad and not knowing whether the animal's going to die or how long it's going to take or it's the not worst seeing him again. feeling again. It, really it is, is the worst feeling it will daunt you it will haunt you for months yeah, yeah. So unless you're sure and you're confident, um, and for most people, especially new people getting into it, I would limit yourself to broadside and yeah, definitely. quartering away shots up to that sort of 45-degree quartering.
in most situations, if you if they don't know you're there and you're hanging out with them, eventually they're going to give you a shot. You just sit and wait, and you'll get a shot. Yeah, you just you be just patient. Wait. Yeah, yeah. You gotta, yeah, you gotta be patient. You gotta be disciplined. Um, know your limits, and yeah, there's a lot of factors that go into bow hunting and make it sort of what it is and how challenging. Like it's a game of inches or even millimeters at some points. So yeah. So we've got yeah, some so fellow bucks quartering away. Yeah. Um, would that be too far for wood? No. Nah. No, it'd be I good. Would, yeah, halfway between that gap in their front legs. Yeah, which is I um much. wouldn't go any further forward. Yeah, because you're flooring, you've kind of got from there all the way back to the back of where that line kind of makes a bit of like a triangle. Yep. Yeah, so there, pretty you kind of got there. you can see pretty much in line with that off leg. So I would probably use that off leg as my line, uh huh, or, or the front of that off leg because you kind of trying to angle through to the point of the offside shoulder um, to get that heart as it goes through. Oops. Yeah, so those two crosses there. So I would, my ultimate perfect shot would be that height right between those two crosses to yeah. the front of that offside leg would be the perfect height. More in line. In line. Yeah. Yep. Yeah, yeah so idea. that's where I'd go for that one. Yeah. So that, that would be 100%. That's collecting that heart on the way through that's incredible all right we're going to do this one as our last one because we're out of time unfortunately yeah. now yeah. our little fawn shot we didn't want to do this one but it was the only quartering like hard quartering away shot that i could kind of actually find <laughs> in my quick search that i was doing before this so i mean even even that as a shot is not ideal yeah yeah so that is a shot where you can the only risky part about this shot is you have a narrow um, window mm -hmm. of left and right for this Definitely. shot. Yeah. So you want to be, yeah, you just want to clear that back hip bone that you can yeah. see there. You want, kind of want to essentially hit that offside shoulder or the front of that offside shoulder. So pretty well where you've got that cross there, maybe it's tiny, right. slightly back. Because yeah. um, you always want to be slight, on quartering away, you want to be slightly further back than too far forward. So you're aiming for this point the on the back shoulder. Is that that offside saying? shoulder, yeah, because he's turned. Anywhere so within that, that, though, or are you just wanting? Okay, so see that split between his front legs? Mm -hmm. Come straight up from that. Yeah. You don't want to be in front of that. Yeah. Because if you go in front of that V, you're sort of kind of potentially going in front of the heart, and that's ending uh, out the chest. Yeah. Um. Okay, okay. So you kind of want to hit where that cross is right there would be hitting the point of that offside shoulder, like the front of that offside leg mm -hmm. at that height. Yeah. Um, so you got pretty much got from there and then back yeah. without hitting that that hip. Yeah. Really Which is a very effective shot because that's going through a lot of the body when you think about it. Um, it's, yeah, the only risky thing about shots that are that hard quartering is your narrow window for line. Um, you don't have much play left or right. Mm. And then also on bigger animals, um, like I think I mentioned that big 45 and a half inch Billy that I shot last year, he was a quartering. The first shot was hard quartering away, pretty much exactly like this. Um, but if you just flip it and he was facing the other way. Yeah, wow. The broadhead. So I hit him with a three blade and that broadhead actually hit right there where we're talking. So mm. my line was perfect. I ain't in the right spot. The shot was really close, like seven or eight meters. Um, and it actually hit the outside of the rib cage. And because of the angle was so steep on those ribs, it ran down the outside mm. of the rib cage and then buried once it sort of hit that pocket behind the elbow. And that's yeah. where it buried like sort it. of in the front of his chest. Yeah. Um, and there was a big, there was a cut probably eight inch gash where that broadhead actually run down the outside um, just because it was such a steep angle. So in some cases that can potentially happen on those really steep um, quartering away like that. But like that Billy, I quickly got a second shot into him, but that first shot did get into, it did bury into his chest cavity um, and collect a lot of vitals. But yeah, that's, they're kind of the risk you run um, from a shot angle like that. Definitely. Well, dude, I'm going to have to cut it there. Unfortunately, I got to jump upstairs real quick and look after my daughter. But um, I think that yeah, was incredibly no insightful. And if you guys didn't get to watch, make sure you jump on and watch the YouTube channel because 
even some of the positions I was putting in and thinking that would be a good shot, like just to get Liam's extra double check on it and say, oh, just slightly back or just slightly forward. That was actually super insightful, bro. So thank you. Once again, yeah, no, Liam was... underscore bow hunter. That yeah, was sick, dude. So if anyone's got any questions, like if I don't reply, I'm either at work or busy, but I do get back to even like messenger, messenger sitting in my requests. Like I try to get onto all of them um, and yeah, always keen to help people out and help people become sort of better bow hunters because it's not easy. It is challenging tasks, um, but we're all very passionate about it. And yeah. So if anyone wants any tips, any feedback, anything like that, yeah. Um, yeah. Have to help anyone out or have a chat or conversation to anyone. So I appreciate you, bro. You're a good, good gem for our bow hunting community. That's for sure. <laughs> Thanks man. I really appreciate it. <laughs>